Okay, members. The next item of business are the motions to approve seven statutory rules, all of which relate to the health protection regulations. There will be a single debate on all seven motions. You, you know the form. Um, I will ask the clerk to read the first motion, then call on the minister to move it. The minister will then commence the debate on all of the motions as listed on the order paper. When all who wish to speak have done so, I shall put the question in the first motion. The second motion will then be read into the record, and I will call the minister to move it. The question will then be put on that motion. This process will be repeated for each of the remaining statutory rules. If that is clear, I shall proceed. Uh, clerk, I would ask you to read the first motion, please. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 19, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. I guess next item, Sir Erin Iroh Kearney, Lesion Wallow Corhon Tosse, and I call Minister Kearney to move the motion. Yerim Sikajian and Runa Corhon Ken, I beg to move. Thank you very much, Gurumila uh, Mayagat. The Business Committee has agreed that there should be no time limit on this debate. I call on the Minister to open the debate on the motions, please. Ira Lidahal. Gurumayagat Salyachian Korya. As you are aware, the most recent amendments to the regulations were announced in the Chamber on the 6th of January. Members heard directly from the Executive on these amendments. This included statements from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, the Health, Education and Justice Ministers, and allowed members an element of scrutiny before they were made. Today, Junior Minister Lyons and I are bringing forward Amendments 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 and 25 to the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2 Regulations 2020. Members will be aware that these amendments enacted measures that span the period up to and during the Christmas holidays and the subsequent weeks. With your permission, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and given the number of amendments we are dealing with today, I will briefly set out the context of where we were when the first of the seven sets of amendment regulations were made. Janima Koralahar Ernalyasi Hashaw a Talarna the Yisbrak and Leonu, a me Yeru and Or, Glak and Imanus Kinu, Sri Srienta Ura a Horch a Vine. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will then focus my remarks on the amendments at the centre of today's debate. In mid-October, the Executive agreed to a period of tighter restrictions. Following a week in November, where certain relaxations to the restrictions were permitted, a further two weeks of enhanced restrictions were put in place from the 27th of November until the 11th of December. These restrictions were reflected in a series of amendments to the regulations up to and including the No. 18 Amendment. The Executive then agreed at its meeting on 3 December to allow a certain degree of reopening on 11 December. In some areas, they regulated for tighter measures than those that had existed before mid-October. These decisions were informed by medical and scientific advice, the assessment of coronavirus impacts on health at that time, and the most up-to-date modelling. This formed the basis of Amendment 19 of the regulations. I will now briefly summarise all seven statutory rules. I will begin with Amendment No. 19, which, as mentioned, came into effect on the 11th of December. It introduced a number of significant changes, including reopening of the hospitality sector with additional requirements for unlicensed premises to bring them in line with licensed premises with regard to seating and gathering of customer information an upper limit of 500 persons for outdoor gatherings or sports events or gatherings and, require, and requirements on a responsible person and risk assessment to be carried out, a right of appeal to a court against a premises improvement notice or a prohibition notice, reopening of close contact services with additional requirements to see clients by an appointment-only system and gathering of customer information. Removal of restrictions on the opening of non-essential retail businesses, amendments to operating hours of hospitality services, including takeaway services and the sale of alcohol, and 
The regulations reverted to the mid-October restrictions relating to places of worship, marriages and civil partnerships, funerals and committals. Amendment 20, which came into effect on the 16th of December, amended the requirement for review of these regulations to allow extra time for data to become available after the Christmas holidays. It also amended the period a person must wait before forming a new linked household from 14 days down to 10 days to reflect the decrease in self-isolation period and permitted a supermarket to use any till or checkout aisle for intoxicating liquor off sales. This allowed customers to use all aisles to reduce congestion and overcrowding and ensure social distancing could be maintained. Some minor corrections and technical amendments to the regulations to permit the continued operation of business financial support schemes were also made under Amendment 20. Amendment 21 came into operation on the 17th of December and clarified some issues around entertainment and gatherings, including what constituted a single gathering if entertainment is provided in a venue, the definition of entertainment for the purposes of the regulations, and to clarify that in an outdoor venue each group at a table is considered to be a separate gathering if no entertainment is provided, and that all the persons in a room are considered to be a single gathering if entertainment is provided. Amendment 22 came into operation on the 18th of December. These provided for extended linked households at Christmas to reflect the guidance on households meeting over Christmas and forming Christmas bubbles, allowed the use of conference facilities by courts and tribunals, and covered some technical corrections in the regulations. Amendment 23 came into operation on the 23rd of December and limited a Christmas bubble to one day and prohibited overnight stays connected to a Christmas bubble. Moving to the final two amendments, which reintroduced restrictions immediately after Christmas in response to an escalating disease situation and significant hospital pressures, Amendment 24 came into operation on midnight of the 25th of December, and it remains in place today. This amendment introduced the following measures. Closure of non-essential retail businesses, including click and collect services. Closure of close contact services, including driving instruction, with some exemptions. Closure of indoor and outdoor visitor attractions and sports and leisure facilities. Indoor and outdoor gatherings in private dwellings limited to members of one household and their linked household to a maximum of 10 people, including children aged 12 or under, from the two linked households to gather indoors or outdoors at a private dwelling at any one time. Indoor and outdoor gatherings, excluding private dwellings, only permitted up to a maximum of 15 people, including children aged 12 or under, with exemptions in place for work, blood donations, vaccinations and education. Indoor sport only permitted for elite athletes or for PE in or for schools. Outdoor gatherings for the purposes of exercise or sport only permitted for elite athletes, physical education in or for schools, if participants are members of the same household or linked household, or if exercise is taken by an individual and their carer or carers. Spectators not permitted for sporting events and closure of all hospitality, with some exceptions, including takeaway and delivery services, permitted from 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. Additional restrictions were in place between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. from the 26th of December to the 2nd of January. These stricter measures were no household mixing in private gardens or indoors in any private dwelling except for emergencies or the provision of health or care services. These restrictions also applied to gatherings with a linked bubbled household. Indoor and outdoor gatherings with members of more than one household were not allowed. 
indoor and outdoor sporting events were not allowed, with the exception of training by elite athletes and exercise taken with members of your own household or linked household, or exercise by an individual and their carer or carers. Essential retail could not operate except for deliveries of groceries only or click and collect of groceries on an appointment only basis. Hospitality could not operate between these times, including deliveries. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the final Amendment 25 came into operation on the 29th of December and made the following changes. Permitting taxi or vehicle hire businesses to operate during the period of tighter restrictions between 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. from the 26th of December until the 2nd of January. More clearly defined, the operating hours of businesses selling food and drink to prevent businesses from flouting the regulations by taking orders prior to 11 p.m., but continuing to operate via delivery into the early hours of the morning, providing that the power to require people to return home would operate only up to the 2nd of January 2021. <laughs> The Sulogum, Gulerian, and Major Terracha Ogum are in Kohax in our common Narela Hasha, Agasna Kospari Awanas Law. I hope that provides you and members with a summary of the context in which these regulations were made and an outline of their content. Mullaman Run, Agas Narela Ha Dunchunnel. I commend the regulations to the Assembly. Christian Eimanish, uh, Colin McGrath. I now call the Chair of the Executive Committee. The Executive Office. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I rise to speak on behalf of the Committee for the Executive Office. The statutory responsibility for scrutinising these regulations lies with the Health Committee, and I look forward to hearing from uh, Committee members later in this debate. And as I have stated in previous speeches to the House in this matter, the Committee for the Executive Office has been consistent in its message throughout this pandemic. Everyone needs to uh, comply with the restrictions in place to protect themselves, their families and others in the community. The Committee remains committed to the need for strong public messaging, a united front in tackling the pandemic, and for us all to do what we must do to keep people safe. The extension of the restrictions last week uh, and, and last month is indicative of the serious nature of the situation that we are all facing, and consequently the Committee welcomes legislation that is intended to protect the community. I would now like to make a number of points in my, compas uh, my capacity as an SDLP MLA, uh, and I welcome the opportunity to be able to take part in this debate today. Um, as has been noted, the health protection regulation amendments we are debating and being asked to ratify today are numbers 19 through to 25. Now, I have said many times in this chamber that the way that we ratify these restrictions, uh, frankly, seems more convoluted than it needs to be, and today's debate could not be more illustrative of that. Today we are debating Amendment 19, which concerned the easing of restrictions and came into effect on the 11th of December. Amendment 20, which amended Christmas bubbling and the length of time people had to stay in self-isolation, came into effect on the 16th of December. Amendment 21, which concerns entertainment venues, came into effect on the 17th of December. Amendment 22, which concerned Christmas bubbling, again, and it came into effect on the 18th of December. Amendment 23, which made Christmas celebrations a one-day event, uh, came into effect on the 23rd of December. And Amendment 24, which is the reintroduction of restrictions, coming into effect on the 24th of December. And finally, Amendment 25, which concerns taxis and the limiting of operating hours, came into effect on the 29th of December. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, this really is quite the timeline. But what is it a timeline of? Is it a reflection of our health care system or staff? Is it a timeline of the public adherence to the regulations? Or perhaps it is a timeline of how businesses have responded to the virus? Well, no, 
The timeline that I have detailed is a reflection of the joint heads of government who allowed par par petty politicking to get in the way of public health, public messaging and local businesses. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, however they try to spin it, the long and the short of it is that their dysfunctional relationship has resulted in where we have ended up today, which is instead of any sort of forward planning, they have instead reacted to every utterance of this virus and how it has impacted our daily lives. We are almost a year into this pandemic. At this stage, inability or unwillingness is no excuse. Frankly, they never were, uh, but you would like to think at this stage that the two parties would have learned something. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am sure my MLA colleagues in Sinn Féin and the DUP will sit there and shake their heads and denounce my words today because they know that it is a five-party executive. So why is it uh, someone from the SDLP that is standing up and saying this? And while I am certainly not privy to the workings of an executive and the meetings, I do hear about those meetings from local broadcast reporters on Twitter, and it does give the impression that the papers surrounding the restrictions that we are debating are not being distributed in good time. Meanwhile, the cross-community vote has been employed in the past, and we all know where that has left us. And all at the same time, our public are contracting the virus. They are dying from the virus, businesses are falling apart, and our high street is disappearing. And our healthcare staff continue to cry out that they are at their breaking point. In the run-up to Christmas, we were able to offer our public a bit of hope for their Christmas and a hope for the new year as the vaccine became more readily available and then the time, timeline I have detailed rolled out. Our response from our government unravelled and we witnessed those awful and horrifying spiking numbers. Now, some may be asking what is going to be my final analysis of that. Well, back in March, I said in this very chamber when we discussed the coronavirus bill, I said that this moment, this day, can be the defining moment of this Assembly. There is no other single issue, not one in a generation, which has brought people together and washed clean old grievances as this one. And while our public have had to socially distance themselves and separate themselves from loved ones, they have actually been brought closer together. But they have not reneged on what they have had to do. When businesses were faced with a terrifying virus, they put in the manpower and responded in such a way to support the public, and they have not reneged on this. And when our health care system faced a pandemic no one had seen the likes of before, the staff stepped up to the mark went over and beyond the call of duty and issued a fearless response with such courage and relentless energy that a gladiator would have been envious of, and they have not once backed down from this challenge. Mr Deputy Speaker, what did we see from our joint heads of government? We saw petty politicking, pride and reaction. And at this stage, I think the public have frankly had enough of that. So I would say get your heads in the game, get over yourselves and show leadership. We have had enough of reactions. We have had enough of bickering. We have had enough of division. It is time to start forward planning and looking for an exit strategy from this virus. Thank you. I call Paula Bradshaw, Deputy Chair of the Health Committee. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I stand in today for the Chair and Vice Chair. I, will, um, I rise initially to respond on behalf of the Committee and will then make some remarks in a personal capacity. The suite of rules before us today give effect to different, quite different approaches to restrictions within a few short weeks. The Committee's briefing on the regulations spanned its meetings of 14 and 21 of January, the former of which I chaired. Members acknowledge the grave circumstances in which we find ourselves and the need to do all we can to reduce the strain on the health service and its staff who are facing into the 11th month of relentless pressure on our behalf. Having discussed on many occasions the urgency with which these regulations are being made and the resulting lack of prior engagement and impact assessment, the committee 
inquired about efforts to analyse the impact retrospectively to ensure future regulations are informed by such learning. The Director of Pub Population Health advised the committee that significant progress had been made in consulting the sectors affected by the regulations and that the number of amendments reflected the learning and responsiveness. She further alluded to an ongoing review of the impact of the regulations. When asked by the committee to share the outcomes of the review, however, the official indicated that she would have to take this request away for consideration since it is more of a continuous process. The committee would appreciate early sight of any analysis produced by the review. Asked about the learning in relation to the arrangements put in place over Christmas, the director acknowledged that what we are seeing now is clearly the impact of the relaxations that we are talking about today, but pointed out that Amendment 25, reversing some relaxations, reflected a response to the emerging data. She further advised that the modelling group is engaged in a constant process of review, overseen by the Chief Scientific Advisor and provided with, an updated, with updated information on a weekly basis. In terms of compliance raised by members, the Director acknowledged that it remains an area of ongoing concern, advising that there is active discussion on the subject across various groups, levels and sectors. She explained that the approach remains one of education first, in an effort not to be heavy-handed, and that the interplay between rules and public attitudes and behaviours is not always predictable. Reflecting on the extension of the requirements to gather customer information, the official was asked whether any consideration had been given to including postal addresses in order to discourage breach of the two-household rule in hospitality settings. The committee was advised that names and phone numbers are collected primarily to enable customers to be contacted if necessary, but the official undertook to consider the potential compliance benefits of requesting postal addresses. I would be grateful if the junior minister, who will be responding, could give any available update on this matter. Effective scrutiny and accessible information remain significant issues for the committee. Members have not always found the online information entirely clear, up-to-date and accessible. Given that we are now at Amendment 25 to the number two regulations, the committee has previously asked to be provided with what effectively would be a tracked change version, showing the net effect of the amendments at any given point. This has not been forthcoming, and again, the official simply directed the committee to look at the NI Direct website. I have to say, um, as a committee member who has long sought improved communication, that I don't think that this is good enough, and I suspect members all agree with me on that point. I do not see why the committee cannot be added to the list of recipients being provided with accessible versions of the regulations to facilitate it when it undertakes the scrutiny. On a more positive point, we were advised that the most recent version of online information has been translated into a number of languages. This is very welcome and something the committee has long been calling for. Economic questions have also been raised by the committee, given the wide-ranging impact of these health protection regulations. Um, officials were asked for their response to frustrations expressed by local retailers seeing multinationals continue to sell um, items they cannot as small operators. The issue of closing times for takeaway services was also raised. The committee was advised that the issues would be considered further. As previously discussed, Members have concerns about the limitations of post hoc scrutiny and the continuing approach to legislating without formal consultation and impact assessment. It is acknowledged, however, that this opportunity for debate allows members to place on record their views, and we trust it will inform subsequent regulations. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish to make some remarks in a personal capacity. The regulations are already passed. However, what can we learn from them? Amendment 19, members will recall, followed a series of attempts by one party in the executive to reopen higher risk services, contrary to the scientific advice in November. And I think the Health Minister has implicitly at least already noted that even this date was clearly too soon. We could already see at the time, not least in the scale of the queue outside Premark and the Abbey Centre immediately at midnight, and the inability and practice of many venues to keep up with the new requirements posed by the regulations, not least around maintaining contact details and ensuring spacing while remaining profitable. That such a reopening with fully two weeks to go until Christmas was going to create 
a problem down the line. Members all need to be clear that the health emergency is the economic emergency. Mr. Le Mr. Deputy Speaker, one problem that this seems to with this that does seem to happen is the scale of the risk. Um, I think that it was poorly understood. For all the emphasis on distancing, it has been clear since September or earlier that indoor venues are high risk because of transmission of the virus through aerosols. Even at more than two metres, the risk is high, particularly if staying in the venue for a period of time, and even more so if face coverings are not worn, as they cannot be done while eating and drinking. Even currently, this raises questions about the risk of workplaces uh, or places like motorway service stations where people can still be seen eating and drinking and therefore not, eating, uh, not wearing face coverings indoors. Let us just look at the case numbers, which we all... We um, no follow actual infections by some days as they typically follow symptoms, test arrangements and result reporting. On the 16th of December there were um, 510 confirmed cases. On the 23rd of December there were 787 and on the 30th of December there were 2,143. Peak in hospitalisations then followed a fortnight later. We may, we may hope that the peak in terms of death has now passed too, but the numbers are still horrendous. We need to be aware that there is a penalty for, uh, we have to pay for pushing to open indoor venues before time. It is clear in the emergence emerging research and it is utterly obvious in the case of hospitalisation and the numbers daily. Let, us, let there be no more denial about what that impact is. As noted, Amendment 20 and 21 are tidy up amendments, but Amendment 22 then implemented the Christmas dub bubble. Amendment 23 then reduced this to a single day. This and here the Health Minister will, has been more overt. Um, that things went wrong was a mess right across the UK. There is a legitimate question to be raised about how enforceable Christmas res restrictions, particularly regarding private homes, would have been anyway. The Office of National St Statistics suggests from the trends of affection that UK-wide there is evidence that people are beginning to gather in homes for Christmas even before the 23rd. The date from which they were allowed to in law in most areas, although that um, this depends uh, a little on how much difference the new variant made to transmission. The evidence from Great Britain in fact shows that during the actual Christmas bubble period, people largely avoided risky contacts even though they were permitted, perhaps taking the opportunity to meet others, but intentionally staying away from older people and those with underlying conditions. Therefore, this is as yet limited evidence that the spike in cases and hospitalisations arose from permitting meetups in private homes for one day over the immediate Christmas period. The evidence for increased contact and thus increased transmission points more to the period before it. It would be useful to have more direct research from Northern Ireland to confirm that the trends were similar to those found in Great Britain. It is worth noting, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we have seen from the dramatic rise in infections in the new year in the Republic of Ireland that a travel ban cannot stop a dramatic rise in case rates if an upward trend in contact and thus infections is already ongoing. We can see that the virus, both in old and new variants, are already circulating far too rapidly um, before Christmas. And and the fact that infections were evidently set on an upward trend from the 11th of December was the reason for Amendment 24, closing so-called non-essential shops and hospitality immediately on Christmas Eve to avoid the Boxing Day sales rush. And all the evidence suggests that was wise, as I've just outlined. Amendment 25 then provided clarification around taxi services. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have gone some way this year towards reducing the infection rate, but still not far enough. Infections are still too high, pressure on hospitals is too big and the imp impacts of, on our population's well-being is too fast. However, there is evidence that the immediate Christmas period, that from the immediate Christmas period, that when people are given clear guidance, they will behave responsibly. We need to redouble our efforts around the messaging, most notably around avoiding the three C's, crowds, contact and closed spaces. If we give the public the right tools, I have faith that we will see the next few months through until the impact of the vaccination programme is fully felt. There is clear light at the end of the tunnel, but we must maintain our courage and discipline until then. Thank you. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And again, I rise in the House to talk on the restrictions before us today. Before I do so, I suppose I would like to recognise where we are in relation to the latest COVID statistics. 
As of today, our seven-day rate of positive cases was 261.5 per 100,000, with 422 new cases and, sadly, 17 deaths. While still alarmingly high, it is indeed our hope that we continue to see a downward trajectory. I would also like, as is always done in these debates, to pay tribute to the staff, in particular our healthcare staff involved in the respiratory teams across Northern Ireland, who have been under significant pressure, particularly over this period, uh, whether it is through winter pressures, uh, already seeing heart large numbers into our hospitals, but indeed the influx of COVID patients. Their, their job is uh, it's deserving of, of pundits from us all as to the hard work that they're doing. I was particularly struck at the weekend, Mr Deputy Speaker, when I seen a posting from a local priest uh, in the Craigavon area where he talked about receiving that call to go to the hospital uh, to tend to one of his parishioners as they ended, uh, come towards the end of their life COVID positive. Um, he talked about entering into that hospital and seeing four or five people around the bed in full PPE, gowns, uh, visors, masks, everything. And he could hear tears. He seen one holding the hand of his parishioner and another one aloud but softly praying for the gentleman that he was caring for. Initially thinking that this must have been family, he was even more touched when he realised it wasn't family at all. It was our nurses and doctors that tended to the bedside of that patient, and how common that must be in these difficult days. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, there is no doubt that we have seen quick developments throughout the past couple of months, and I suppose probably I do welcome the call to aid for those uh, medical professionals, and indeed uh, the deployment of mi uh, military medical personnel is a welcome move. But I have to say I regret that we have reached the situation that it has become necessary. And I also regret the tone in which some members, both in this House and some individuals outside it, took to those professionals coming in to help support our frontline services, who have not only the logistical but medical expertise and professionalism that could play their part in repelling uh, the COVID-19 virus as it stands. The restrictions before the House today, as has been mentioned, are quite wide-ranging, some in the extent that they are no longer relevant in relation to the Christmas period, but others which are very, very wide-ranging and will have wide-ranging consequences springing therefore. And I think it is only but right that the House consider that, because it is not only the restriction in particular Amendment 24 and 25 that we must consider, but it is the knock-on effect and something that we must take into account. I want to talk about the impact of the restrictions before us today and the wider lockdown in managing COVID-19. Inevitably, restrictions are put in place to help, as it, has, as it has done, reduce positive cases, reduce pressure on hospitals, particularly when we have a COVID patient influx and already existing winter pressures. We, by means of restrictions, are trying to manage the situation until a sustainable solution and way forward is found. And I understand this and I appreciate this that our primary aim has to be to protect the health service. Though equally, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it is important to note that restrictions on lockdown measures are not a cure to COVID nineteen. As has been seen around the world and indeed in Northern Ireland, once restrictions are lifted, cases go up and we face a repeat cycle. I think um, members can agree that, as a society, we need to learn to move beyond the blunt instrument of restrictions and lockdown. I'm sure this is something that we can all agree with, because we have agreed on that point before, albeit the pressures that come with COVID-19 have been relentless. But I want to examine, and we must, we must recognize, we need to examine some of those in light of the restrictions before us today as to the lockdown and how it can have a long, shadowy impact on many sections of our society. How does restriction, restrictive measures before us today and lockdowns in general impact upon society? Well, let's look, for example, Mr Deputy Speaker, at the working poor. Job losses, bills, financial pressures, family life. While it may be okay, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
for people who have the luxury of green open spaces in their gardens or indeed a wide family bubble to support them. But for many of the working poor throughout Northern Ireland and indeed the world, the COVID restrictions and the COVID measures in place to bring the virus under, the, under control has had a devastating, long-lasting impact. We have to recognise that because it is true. And I'm not here to lay the blame at anybody's door, Mr Deputy Speaker, either. I'm simply outlining the effects of COVID restrictions, and indeed that includes the ones that we have before us today. I also want to say another section of our society, and it's been well documented, are children and young people. The closure of schools, lack of face-to-face -face teaching, impact on progression and basic skills. It was noted in a recent Stranmillis University report that motivation has been one of the key elements noticed by those that conducted the study in relation to our young people. They no longer have the motivation to learn the essential life skills that they would do in a classroom. We only have to engage with the many parents who are struggling with home education, homeschooling, to realise the devastating impact that lockdown is going to have on our children. Now, I understand, and quite rightly in the House, there is a divided opinion as to how safe the school environment can be. But it is upon us to ensure that as quickly as possible we provide the space in which our children can return to education and provide them with those basic needs. Mr Speaker, when I look at our young people and I try to highlight and I ask parents this, what has been the major defects and defaults from lockdown and indeed restrictions? They talk about them being failed academically, emotionally, physically and indeed socially. We have to realise that the restrictions that we put in place, albeit to stem the COVID influx, have long-lasting impacts. And I think that's a, that's a point that's lost on a lot of members, because while restrictions have been seen to become the norm for dealing with COVID-19, it's what the long-term outcome of those re restrictions cause upon other sections of our society that we need to take into account. It was mentioned earlier by uh, John O'Dowd in relation to the lack of opportunities for, and difficulties for university students. That's another one. It's not just facing our young primary school children, but right through. That experience has been lost, uh, and we have to take cognizance of that fact. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about our vulnerable, cancer patients and those suffering from mental health. The restrictions, and in particular the ones that we study today, coincide with some devastating news, the cancellation of cancer services across Northern Ireland. Now, some will say, what do they have to do with the current restrictions that we have before us today? There is no doubt that the restrictions that we have before us today coincide by trying to drive down infection rate, which has also led to the closure of cancer services. Mr Deputy Speaker, cancer cancellations is the greatest COVID sin of all. And it should never rest easy with any member that we have been forced down a path whereby those that require urgent and immediate surgery have either a fear to go to their a and &E and present, they are not seeing their GPs through lack of face-to-face -face consultations. There is a real palpable anger, and you only have to listen to the radio pro programmes and TV shows across this country to realise that those with cancer are suffering. There is not a family represented in this House that I would imagine that has not been impacted by cancer. All the more alarming when we are dealing with it in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic. I raised at the Health Committee last week, Deputy Speaker, the plight of two individuals that, because of no face-to-face -face consultations in GPs, had rang through. They were told that their symptoms uh, would be prescribed via, I think it was, painkillers. Two or three times this happened. When the pain continued, they presented at A&E. Cancer was diagnosed. Advanced stages, they were dead within four days. 
That was a tragic story. I asked this question of the health trust uh, personnel that we had before us, and they talked about late diagnosis. The evidence from the health trust were damning when it came to cancer. Number of cancers detected down. Number of red flag is coming forward down. Late presentations at A&E on the up. A pause in paediatric services. These are the results of restrictions. It's easy for any member to get up and say we should restrict and we should place society in, in elements of restrictive measures to deal with COVID. But we also must reflect that it does indeed have impacts upon other services. I will on that point. I thank the member for giving way. Uh, and uh, I, I was there at the health meeting last week when the chief executives from three different trusts were in. And would, would, would the member agree with me? I mean, we're, we're being told, depending on what stats we listen to, whether it's from the department or NISRA, there are either slightly less or slightly more than 2,000 people who have died as a result, direct result of COVID-19. But there are many, many more people who have lost their lives in this emergency as a result of cancer. And, and it was very poignant, the two cases that the member mentioned in the committee last week. But there are multiple cases like this. And, and, and someday we, we have to get the true figures of the number of people who have died in this emergency. I, I thank the member for his point. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is what the restrictive measures can do. And it's important that we note, and, and we just don't nod through restrictions without considering their very real impact on normal people. And Mr. Sheehan's point is quite correct, because while we have been dealing with COVID pandemic, and I, I, I fully understand that, I see the pain that families are suffering as a result of deaths through COVID-19. I see the pressure on health professionals. I see the pressure on our government departments. I see it all. But equally, it would be remiss of me as an elected member of this House if I sat and did not make comment upon the wishful thinking that some can say that we pass regulations and we don't look to their wider implications upon society. That is something that has become upon members in this House. Members, these t statistics that are before us and that Mr Sheehan should mention, should send shivers up every one of our spines. It scares me, and I would say without doubt, it scares many members in this House. It is deeply worrying that despite the current restrictions starting um, to bring limited re uh, rewards, sufficient capacity has still not been found to, uh, has been achieved to allow the cancellation of surgery to resume at even close to normal levels. The number of non-COVID patients in ICU or general beds also continues on a disconcerting downward trend. We have already heard the harrowing reports of cancer diagnosis coming too late because of uh, whether it's presenting at A&E too late or whether it's not fear of coming forward. For this is to be compounded by cancellation of their scheduled surgery. It is a bitter, bitter blow which sadly will inevitably lead to lives being lost that would otherwise have been saved. There is also a fear that surgeons who have been out of the theatre for so long, this was mentioned at the committee, will have missed out on training and development which could jeopardise the full resumption of services once this pandemic has ended. I was also shocked to learn at the Health Committee that there is evidence last week, as I've said, that paediatric surgery has been subject to suspension. And there are serious concerns as to how this will affect children and young people's health and well-being now and into the future. Now, the restrictions that are in place, I have, as I have outlined, can have a devastating impact on other services. But I just don't want to talk about problems. And again, I, I, I preface this with the point, I'm not here to attack. I'm here to speak on behalf of those who have been impacted in, on COVID restrictions in many ways. I want to look at possible solutions. There is a worry that due to COVID-19 and the restrictions in place, that potentially curable cancers have been detected at an advanced stage. For example, there's many sad cases of advanced throat cancer which could have been detected earlier 
Other cancers such as bowel, which, diagnose, which diagnosis is based on symptoms of change of bowel habit, would ordinarily be referred by GP to Red Flag Clinic. I do not see how this cannot continue and carry on. These symptoms can be picked up in history making, but sadly because of COVID-19 restrictions in place, they are not being picked up. They are presenting late and automatically placed on late life-ending treatment. Perhaps people are not aware that GP doors are still open. Perhaps there are flaws in the system. For example, who is triag uh, triaging the calls? Are they receptionists? Or are they qualified uh, professionals? After all, this is new to everyone, and I would implore the junior ministers to take this point up with the health minister, because this is something that has been lost as we've been debating regulations. We need to realise that COVID is here and does not seem to be going anywhere quick. Do we therefore need to think about opening satellite centres for cancer patients? to be seen by the professionals they need, be that a surgeon, oncologist, palliative care specialist? Could we be making better use of peripheral facilities? We all know within our own trusts, perhaps buildings that haven't been used because uh, staff are working from home. There's space maybe to allow for some sort of cancer centres to, to open. Could we be introducing a system whereby a patient has a COVID test done 48 hours before an appointment? I will on that point. I appreciate the member's um, enthusiasm for this subject, but maybe on that long list will the member even suggest that whilst the Her Majesty Government was actually extremely generous to this place and to the tune of three billion, that maybe some encouragement could go to the Finance Minister to get the three hundred million to some of the company directors who are only offered a thousand pounds. Um, just on that, I'm conscious now, and I do respect the member's genuine points that he's making. I really do respect that, and I've given a fair amount of latitude to that because it is so crucially important and serious for many people in the community. But if we could just move back on to the regulations, please. Deputy Speaker, I thank you for your indulgence on this point because, as I've said, the restrictions and the amendments are so wide-ranging. It is only but right that, as elected members, we consider their full impact upon society. And, you know, as I've said, cancer affects everyone, every family. There's not a family that hasn't been touched. And when I look and I hear the stories through email, through phone call, on our radios, I have to say that I have to speak out because I understand the need for restrictions. I do. I'm not here to say to members that I'm a COVID denier. I'm not. All I'm saying is that we need to think about the long-term impacts that they can have on society. Mental health. We've spoken regularly in this place about the impact the pandemic has had. Trust, Belfast Trust experienced a 30 per cent increase in inpatient mental health admissions at the height of the previous lockdown. And it is clear that the extension of these regulations, including the continual closure of schools, requires us to look more at how we can target early prevention of those with mental health, and, and, and particularly among our children. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will move now to uh, Amendment 24, and in particular uh, the issues surrounding small business, another sector that has been profoundly impacted by restrictions that are in place, particularly the closure of non-essential uh, retail businesses and indeed the closure of Click and Collect. Mr Deputy Speaker, the small independent retailer is the backbone of the Northern Ireland economy. And they have looked on at the restrictions that have been put in place with disdain. Their reason that they understand the need for the restrictions that are in place to prevent community transmission. And many of them have put their lifetime work into establishing these businesses. They've been on the high street through thick and thin, through wars, through troubles. They have sustained the Northern Ireland high street. But now, 
they are facing their biggest threat yet. They have been closed, but yet in the very same towns, sometimes on the edges of our town centres, large multinational retailers continue unhindered, selling the very same product that the independent retailer has been closed from selling. That, Mr Deputy Speaker, is ludicrously in the extreme. We need to look how we can deal with this issue, because the independent retailer stands the very risk of never returning to the high street. And I understand and I accept fully um, that the executive office, maybe by means of the junior ministers who will give us an update, have been engaging with that sector. I would like to hope that they have heard loud and clear the frustrations of independent retailers across this country and how we should right the wrongs contained within the current regulation. That, I will on that point. Uh, the member makes a very valid point, but isn't it a point that has been made for months in this House from the very first manifestations of these regulations? And yet, again and again, on successive lockdowns, we have the same flagrant flaw, whereby supermarkets can do what they like and independent retailers are driven off the streets. Why has this executive not closed those loopholes? That's the question that needs to be answered in this House. Thank the member for his intervention, and I'm sure it's something that the junior ministers will take up upon in, in their final contributions, because independent retailers are not being unfair in what they're asking for. Their plea is either you level up in terms of uh, click and collect, or you level down and everybody's on the same footing. That is all they're asking for. I think it is only but right that we in this House fight for that level playing field. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to thank them for their in a moment. I want to thank them for their endurance throughout this time. Because they realise that their sacrifice in terms of their businesses, the jobs, maybe even their livelihood is indeed for a greater cause to try and uh, suppress the virus transmission within the community. Albeit, as I have mentioned, some of those close contact services, I have been sceptical, Mr Deputy Speaker, to say the least, as to the evidence of the community transmission in those places. I think it's been mentioned on many times in this House that actually illegal gatherings, house parties, whatever it may be, is actually a far greater threat than those independent businesses who have probably put more stringent measures in place than the very multinationals that are open uh, freely. We in this House have a duty to repay their faith in the executive's re response by ensuring that we chart a course outside this pandemic. Those businesses devastated by the current rules have access to the vital financial and practical support to get back on their feet. There is a particular responsibility upon ministers to support the needs of our independent retailers who are rightly seeing these large uh, supermarket retailers acting outside the spirit of the regulations in terms of non-essential sales. There are some areas where I believe there should be a scope to give more flexibility, and it was mentioned at the committee, within the structure of the current regulations. For instance, in respect to Amendment 24, some takeaway food businesses have highlighted that the 11 p.m. cut-off point of delivery disadvantages shift workers within our hospital, many of whom are working on the front line. We should be open to listening to these concerns substantively in the coming days. In closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I have outlined throughout my contribution, we must collectively focus our energies on the clear path which gives us the most hope of righting the horrible wrongs of COVID-19, that being vaccination. Now, it has been on note 
on numerous occasions. A lot of the sectors that I have mentioned that have been infected, uh, not infected, but affected by the COVID pandemic. We need now to look at ways and means in which we can protect those sections of society to get them back operational. And I look, and I'm sure many members have this thought as well, in relation to our teachers. We've seen the negative impact that COVID regulations have had on our young people. It's now incumbent upon us to look towards making representations to the GCVI to say, can we vaccinate our teaching population to ensure that we can get our young people back to education as quickly and as safely as possible. Also for those teaching with special educational needs children, they have not for one moment stepped back in this pandemic. They've stepped forward. They've stepped into the breach. We need to now support them with a vaccination programme that is fit for purpose. And on that point, I will commend the current vaccination programme and those administering it because it is a leader. It's a leader within the United Kingdom. In fact, it's compared globally with some vaccination programmes. That's, a, that's a, a true tribute to those that are administering the scheme. And I, I, I do take that uh, point on board that I would like to see the flexibility within the scheme to allow for uh, a process by which we can start to normalise society again. The restrictions alone can never hope to see us through the pandemic, nor can they deflect attention from the need to ramp up that vaccination programme on a mass scale. I've mentioned it at a committee, 24-7 if we can have it. I've looked across the trust, and we would have heard this morning, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, about how trusts have got through the cases within uh, their staff in relation to vaccination. And now we're starting actually to see the slowing down of vaccination centres because there isn't the same footfall coming through them. I, 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 maybe I'm, I'm missing something, but this should be the very time that we should be ramping it up. At the end of the day, if there's spur vaccination, let's see a process by which we can vaccinate teachers. We can vaccinate those that are vulnerable. We all know them. We need to get society moving again and moving quickly. We are now looking to commence vaccination of the over 75s group. And this is a testimony to our dedicated teams and vaccinators. With over a thousand extra volunteers to take up this role, the health minister needs to be looking at expanding the skill set further. As our society does eventually reopen, we have to be mindful that pressures on our public servants, including teachers and police officers, will only increase. We do believe there is merit in providing those workers at high risk with a vaccination programme. And I will close now, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank you for your indulgence on those points which I believe are pivotal in this debate. The road ahead will be long. There will be many twists and turns in relation to COVID and the regulations. And I, for one, don't want to fall out with any member in this House for being passionate about something that I feel is having an adverse impact on people who don't deserve it. And I hope, in the spirit of that debate, that we can continue to confront these issues and deal with this pandemic and sadly deal with the long-term consequences therein. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Um, August Nishiram, Sarah Martina Anderson, Hon Kancha, call Martina Anderson. I rise to speak to amendments 19 through to 25. And I remind this House that on the 5th of October, Derry and Straban were placed under restrictions, and then in the middle of October, uh, the entire North. And we, we realised as time was moving on that uh, the things were going in the wrong direction. And we knew that there were new variants appearing and that the rate of transmission needed us to delay the, uh, the relaxation measures. But it took longer for these amendments that are before us today uh, to, to come into effect because, unfortunately, the DUP used a veto to block a two-week extension of the restrictions, and that was shameful. Now, we know that there has been talk, and in fact, we've just heard some commentary and focus um, put on these restrictions and the implications that these restrictions have on people's lives. 
resulting in people falling into poverty. And I take it that when restrictions like this, when we move on, when things hopefully return to some kind of new normal and that we build back better. And throughout this journey, if there's a, a, an anti-poverty strategy, when that comes on the table of the executive, that we will have full ministerial support for the implementation of that strategy and it being allocated based on objective need. I also want to say, I'll ask Kant Kolya, that as a member of the Executive Office uh, Committee, that the public is fed up. The public's fed up with the SDLP playing some kind of hokey pokey dance during this pandemic, being in the executive and out of the executive. So I can tell you that the public is really fed up with all of that. Amendment 19 deals with the reopening of close contact services. Can I say that there's been a lot of confusion about what a close contact service actually is? And I would like the ministers to take account of this. I've been dealing with a number of photographers. I'm sure I'm not the only one whose businesses evaporated as their operation was severely limited because their customers base, their customers were required to wear a mask. Now, in hairdressers and nail bars and other close contacts, when they were reopened, people were rightly required to wear a mask. So when I asked the ministers to think about this and to reflect this back to their ministerial colleagues, because photographers, you know, you don't, they don't meet, I've been told this by, by officials, they don't meet the legislative definition of a close contact as defined in the health regulations and are designated as a retail service. Now, retail are only eligible for phase three of the COVID support payment. So people were told to wear a mask in retail stores, making it impossible for photographers to carry out their service. You're not going in to get your photo taken when you're wearing a mask. So the businesses were not exempt. The photographers were not exempt in the regulations from wearing a mask. So if they're retail and you have to wear a mask and enter retail, then these photographers who are wanting this assembly to realise that their businesses have been severely uh, limited as a consequence of these restrictions. So I would ask when we're talking about Amendment 19 that perhaps the ministers would please feed that back. Amendment 20 deals with some minor corrections and technical amendments to regulations to permit the continued operation of businesses uh, of the Business Financial Support Scheme the local restrictions. Now, some of these schemes have been a lifesaver for many businesses. And I acknowledge, I acknowledge the work of the executive and the work of the finance minister, Conor Murphy, indeed in comparison uh, to England, where the most the businesses receive is under £800. Here, the executive and the finance minister secured agreement that the least a business would receive here would be £800 for the local assistance support scheme. Now, if we can do that without the economic levers of power, just think what we would do if we had them. But I know in last can call you, the last thing you want me to do is to enter into a debate about the benefits of Irish unity. So I will leave it at that. Amendment 20 addresses the decreased period of self-isolation. Now, I, along with other members across this chamber, have spoken about those on low wages finding it difficult to self-isolate and at the same time trying to put food on the table. Now, welcoming as it is a discretionary support payment, we all know that for households without an income of below 21,000 that you're not eligible in them circumstances. And I'm not the only member. Other members here have raised the issue of care 
carers not receiving statutory sick pay. And whilst the health minister, and he has informed us here and written questions and answers on the floor, he has put financial support in place for the independent sector, for care sector, for carers who need to self-isolate. Employers have told me that some of them are not entitled to receive a payment. Now, employers say that those carers who don't have day one rights, that they must work six months, 26 weeks, before they can receive financial support for self-isolating. And some of these workers are looking at a health and social care service under pressure, and even as we speak here today, are countenance returning to work to help out, to alleviate the pressure, but yet employers are telling me that they are not entitled to day one rights. They're not entitled to financial support. So the lack of such financial support for those who have to self-isolate um, needs to be looked at because if we don't do this, then we, want, we run the risk of the further transmission of this disease because people who are contacted and told they should self-isolate, at times some of them are choosing maybe to continue on to work because they can't afford to do so. So some families had hoped that uh, amendments 21 and 22 would have resulted in their loved ones getting the vaccine so that they could come, become part of the Christmas bubble. And I say this in the context, and I would ask the ministers to take account of hospitals like the Waterside Hospital in Derry. And that hospital, like other hospitals, I have to say, that have such units in the hospital where you have dementia patients in the hospital. And we're hearing about care homes and the vaccine being rolled out there. But the Waterside Hospital, those wards that have dementia patients and patients who have mobility issues, they're not being vaccinated. Now, I actually, and as Ken Kohler, was given information uh, by the, the trust to inform a family that their loved one would get the vaccinated because they wanted them home to form part of the Christmas bubble. They wanted them home to take care of them. The hospital needs the space. And I told the family that they would be getting vaccinated only two weeks later for the trust to tell them, no, he's still not vaccinated because they haven't got, they said, the authorisation from the health minister. So I would ask that that issue is taken account of and the ministers please uh, feed that back. Amendment 21, or 25, sorry, um, permitted taxi hire to operate during the tighter restrictions. But taxi drivers who temporarily suspended their insurance but who were able to operate at that time because they had renewed it are being penalised and will not receive the full grant. They're going to receive a reduced COVID grant support because they were either shielding or the stay-at-home message impacted on their customer base and they simply had no money. It is wrong that the second grant that's going out for the taxi support scheme is going to penalise taxi drivers who temporarily suspended their insurance because they had no money to pay for it. And I would ask that that stops and that they get the full grant like everyone else because they had to pay the full cost of the PPA once they renewed their insurance. So, uh, uh, ministers, I know like everyone else, every one of us in this chamber, we know that the last 12 months has been horrendous, alas, can call you. And unfortunately, like many, many in this chamber, I stand here heartbroken, knowing many of those who've lost their lives, particularly during this wave of COVID. I'm told that in Altony Gavin Hospital, during the first wave, not one death occurred of someone from Derry and Straban. And yet, we're looking now at figures, and uh, I'm seeing my colleague Gary over there, of, um, Derry, of over 110 people dead um, in our council area in Derry and Straban. So I want to send my heartfelt sympathy to all those who have lost their lives due to COVID. And I want especially to send my deepest sympathy to Magella McCourt, who lost her soulmate, her husband, 
and her children lost their father at the weekend. Derry lost a solid Republican who will be sadly missed by all. Thank you. Okay, I now call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, like others, I firstly want to uh, recognise the extreme hurt and pain that uh, many of our constituents are currently suffering, whether that's COVID related or non COVID related. Equally important, and it's important that as we look upon these restrictions and regulations which have been put in place, um, that we are mindful that the impacts of those go well beyond uh, the COVID virus themselves. Um, it affects every area of our lives, uh, and we're seeing that on a day and daily basis, so we just need to be mindful of that. Uh, in terms of the amendments, and Amendment 19 specifically, it deals with restrictions in relation to places of worship and bringing that back, I suppose, at that time it was a relaxation, but I do welcome the fact that uh, many of our churches have shown great leadership in coming to a voluntary arrangement uh, to provide, I suppose, safety for their uh, congrega congregations and parishioners, but also been mindful that uh, they do have a, a very much a leadership role, and I want to thank them and congratulate them for that. Uh, obviously, uh, and it's very, very relevant today, given the day that's in it, uh, the restrictions on funerals. Uh, the restrictions on funerals are limited to 25 people. Now, everyone has the right to remember their dead. And we have to be mindful of that fact that when someone loses a loved one, uh, they are difficult times, uh, and we have to be uh, honest about that. The difficulty, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I have is in relation to once again today within my constituency in Foyle, in the Craigan area, a funeral took place. And that funeral once again broke the restrictions by, by many, many uh, numbers. And I think that that once again is a slap in the face, not only to, to, to uh, our constituents, but a kick in the teeth to our health workers who no doubt will have to deal with the consequences of what happened today. So I just urge all members in this chamber to please speak out, be respectful absolutely of a family who lost a loved one regardless of their, their background, but they need to be honest with the public. As we are putting these restrictions through uh, today and we look at further restrictions in the future, we need to be shown leadership. It needs to be a case of uh, do as I say, and it cannot be a situation where it's do as I say, not as I do. We'll give way to Mr Lannister. Said. Does the member think it would have helped in terms of underscoring the public message that he's just been articulating if the last speaker, Ms Anderson, who referred to the same death, had gone on to condemn the breaching of the regulation at the funeral of that individual? Would that not be of more assistance than simply lauding the individual who has a past which involved him in terrorism. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I completely agree with uh, Mr Alistair's point. And this is very, very relevant because we cannot stand with straight faces and tell members of the public to follow guidelines if we in this chamber are not willing to follow those same guidelines. So I will leave the floor open. I will be speaking for the next number of minutes. If anyone wants to intervene and, and, and give clarity, particularly from Sinn Féin's benches, in terms of how they are giving guidance to their communities, because it is unacceptable and it needs to be addressed. Uh, and as I say, to be honest, it, it causes so much upset to my community, to all of our communities, when they see such uh, shameful disregard for the rule of law. So I just urge members to reflect on that. Uh, I'm going to move on, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, because I am keeping to the amendments in relation to uh, Amendment 20, and it deals with uh, linking uh, households and, uh, and addressing uh, the, the period of time in which a person has to uh, leave before they, they, they move to a different household. I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, Amendment 21 goes on in relation to entertainment venues. Uh, Amendment 22 and 23 and deals with the household restrictions around Christmas time. And when we speak to uh, our constituents and you ask them you know, about Christmas, the, the one common word that you hear is it, it was a quiet one. Uh, that can be good in some ways, but in other ways it has been detrimental. Because I know that whilst the, the Amendment 23 dealt with the issue around 
at the Christmas bubble and it limited to one day. There were many uh, elderly people, particularly vulnerable people, who were isolated uh, and who weren't part of people's bubbles. And we do have to be mindful that the impact of um, those restrictions on those people uh, will be um, will be something that we will be dealing with for some time. But I think that there was a recognition that something had to be done um, at that time to ensure that obviously the virus just didn't completely get out of control. But as I said, it was one of the more difficult, I think, decisions that had to be taken by the executive, uh, a decision that nobody would want to have to take, but it had to be taken at that particular time. Amendment 24 goes on, and it's one of the, I suppose, the bigger amendments, which deals with the tightening of the restrictions, and my colleagues has already touched on the impact in terms of our businesses um, and our economy, and the, the fact that so many of our businesses continue to struggle, and that's why it has always been vital and essential that we get the uh, appropriate financial schemes on the ground as quickly as possible, ensuring that it gets to those who need it most. Uh, I, I do want to say, just in relation to the delivery and the takeaway uh, services, it has been raised with me uh, by a number of local businesses that there is a po they, they feel that, that that does need to be looked at from the perspective that it has an impact on shift workers and key workers who may want to uh, order from those facilities. And it was just something that maybe if the junior ministers could take that away and see if there's something that could be done, maybe just to listen to those concerns. Uh, as I say, if there's real genuine health reasons why the takeaways can't operate past 11 p.m. for delivery services, then it would be useful just to, as I say, just to address that and maybe bring some clarity to that situation as well. I do want to join, again, I've raised this point in this chamber before, I think that the click and collect services, again, is something that could be looked at uh, in relation to uh, that particular amendment. Yeah, absolutely. I thank the member for giving way, and I know he has uh, been on record on this point at the committee. But would he agree with me that if it appears to be transparent that click and collect can't happen for, for reasons presented by medical officials or whatnot, that we look towards a form of click and collect which potentially looks at stricter enforcement rules around it, stricter guidance uh, to enable those small independent retailers to use up some vital stock that, is, that essentially will be worthless? by the time in which their businesses can operate again. Member, for that, I completely agree with that point. Um, you know, one example that was given to me was around a, um, a, a garden centre who stocked flowers. Uh, they had to uh, order the stock a year in advance, so they're sitting now with £25,000 worth of flowers that, that can't go nowhere. Um, and given the fact that Valentine's Day is coming up, for example, uh, uh, and the First Minister did remind me that there's, there's, there's ways and means, but I can assure you, in terms of the, the flower shops, there's, there's great disappointment. And, and it comes to those perishable items. I think that there's, there could be a look at how you can address click and collect. But nobody's advocating. You know, we, uh, on these side of the benches, completely take the COVID virus seriously. But we also have to look at the, the practicalities and how do we... I suppose be innovative uh, and, and allow businesses to operate as safely as possible, whilst also trying to uh, keep a lid on uh, the, the, the level of the virus. I will indeed to the junior minister. Meaning at this stage, only because Mr. Buckley has already raised it, Mr. Middleton has raised it, and I believe other members will want to raise the issue of click and collect. Perhaps I can provide some reassurance to the House at this point uh, in time that on the 21st of January. Um, the, at, at the meeting of the executive, we agreed that the Department of Health and the Department of the Economy would go away and look at ways in which click and collect could be uh, done in a safe manner. Um, I understand the arguments that are being made. We have to understand the health implications uh, as well. But that is an issue that is being looked at uh, between those two departments. I hope we'll have a, a resolution to that, and I hope it brings some comfort to members of the House today. Well, thank the junior minister for that, and it does uh, bring some comfort. Obviously, we would like to see that. Um, come to fruition, and I know that, that many businesses would be um, very much welcoming of, of some sort of movement in regards to that issue. And on the, the Amendment 24, again, that does have, I suppose, the widest impact on the majority uh, of our society in terms of the economy. Um, there are welcome signs that the restrictions are working to a certain degree, and that, of course, they're bringing the number of uh, the rate of infection is coming down, and hospital admissions are gradually 
hopefully going in the right direction, but there's still significant pressure. And I do take my colleague, Johnny Buckley's, uh, Mr Buckley's point in relation to restrictions alone will not solve this crisis. That we have to ramp up the vaccination process. Uh, we need to look at how we do that, maybe uh, you know, mass, ma mass vaccination 24-7, uh, the capacities there, uh, or we need the capacity there. Uh, and, and to that end, I, I said this to the Health Minister earlier on today, I welcome any steps that can be taken to address capacity issues, to provide support. Uh, and, and you know, this isn't about politics. You know, leave the politics out of health. We've said that for quite some time. Uh, and just let the health people get on with it. And where support's required, absolutely bring it in. Uh, we cannot underestimate the significant sacrifice being made by members of the public at this minute in time. They have by the main, abided by the restrictions that's been asked of them. A lot of them have been tough, looking at things that we never thought really we would see in our lifetimes again around issues of curfews and uh, you know, the closures of businesses, the closures of schools, uh, the severe impact that, that that's having on, on mental health. Um, you know, it, just, just on Friday, I heard from the Western Trust that you know, they've seen a 12% increase in, in inpatients into their mental health facilities. These are devastating impacts which will have long, long lasting consequences um, into the future. Um, I, I, I want to move on in relation to, uh, again, I suppose it's in regards to those pressures. And I wanted to come because it is, in all of this stuff, it is about personal stories and about, and about some of the difficulties that people are facing. And I mentioned at the start that these, uh, these amendments and these restrictions and regulations do go beyond COVID. And I know we don't need to tell many people in these, this chamber that that's the case. But I did want to address one uh, point that was raised to me by a constituent. And I believe that he did send this uh, to, to all MLAs, all babies from, from my constituency. And I know the gentleman very, very well. He said to me, and this came last week, by the way, he said, good morning and I hope you're all well. I do not know anyone who has died with COVID in the past 10 months. But I do know two friends who have passed away because of cancer in the past three months. Both of their cases were identical. Each of them had significant pain. They had called their GP and the GP prescribed them with painkillers. As the months went on, they contacted their GP uh, several times and they had telephone um, diagnosis, if you like, and, and conversations, but they never had that face-to-face -face appointment for examinations. Eventually, after nine months, the two individuals that, I, that, I, that my constituent was referring to, the, the pain got so bad that they went to A&E. Uh, they were both admitted, and the next day they had a scan where the cancer was found. And then just four days later, those people died. Unfortunately, that is a story very much familiar to many people across our society. The two that died in those three months, the last one was having her funeral today and she was 56. So that's the reality that we are dealing with when we're putting through amendments and restrictions like this. So I would appeal to those who do deny that COVID exists, and I don't see how they can, but they do exist, to think about the impact that it's having on the likes of that constituent and the families of those who sadly are bereaved. Think of those people when uh, you, you feel that you don't want to abide by those restrictions. And again, and I, and I bring it back to the point, when you see you know, incidents and just blatant breaches of the rules like we've seen today, it's just a real, a real kick in the teeth uh, for all of us who are trying to do our best to get this virus down. Uh, in closing, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Amendment 25, I suppose, is very much uh, speaks for itself in relation to the taxi industry. In closing, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I do want to say that, again, we need to uh, look to the future. We need to ensure that we can ramp up our vaccination process. That's the hope that everybody is clinging to at this minute in time. I think there is a conversation to be had, and a very important one. I know the Education Minister has, has lobbied for this in relation to looking at uh, our special schools and the staff within those schools, uh, looking at our, our teachers and our uh, classroom assistants and those who work within schools, because we do need to recognise that uh, the, the point around education, it's, it's just heartbreaking as a, as a father myself uh, of a young child who, who isn't in school yet but will be in September and you just think about if, if it was your child and I know there's people in here who do have children, your child 
that was sitting in school, uh, or sitting in the education sector at this minute in time, not in school, at home, and just varying amounts of work going on from various, and I, and I uh, am not critical of teachers in, in one respect, but you can't subsidise, a bit like the health service, you can't subsidise for face-to-face -face consultations. You can't subsidise for face-to-face -face education. Um, so just in closing, again, I would urge everyone to please follow the regulations. We're not out of this yet. Uh, and I just, as I say, I thank the uh, junior ministers for being here today. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to support these regulations in front of us today, but with the realisation that uh, in normal times we, we would all reject them uh, without any level of, of debate. Um, I, earlier in the debate, uh, Mr McGrath made a call for an exit strategy, and I, I wish I had his optimistic uh, foresight. Um, he also made a forecast that speakers from the other four parties on the executive would remind him that all decisions are made by a five-party executive, which includes his party, the SDLP. So I'm not going to disappoint him. No amount of passion in making these remarks will cloud or change the reality that it is a five-party executive that make all the decisions uh, around this pandemic. As regards an exit strategy, the member must realise that every time we get a little bit of hope, we get a setback, like the discovery of a new variant of the virus. How and when could anyone plan an exit strategy when the virus and its variants continue to call the tune? There will be a time that we will have to formulate an exit strategy. I just don't think we're there just yet. And for those people outside this House, who are calling for an end to restrictions, I would ask, what is the alternative? They are not in place to punish us, but they are there rather to help protect us. The problem is that too many people are deliberately ignoring the regulations. 95%, maybe even higher, of the people are making huge sacrifices to comply with the regulations, but that 5% are diluting the effectiveness of the regulations. And to use a phrase that's been used in this chamber before, they really do need to wise up. Now, members who spell out the negative impact of these restrictions and the toll it is taking are correct. It is a reality. It is taking a huge toll on everyone. But what is the toll on those families receiving a phone call from a hospital that their loved one has died alone as a result of the virus. They then have to bury their loved one under what amounts to almost a cloak of secrecy. How long will these families take to recover from this? That is an even sadder reality. We talked about delay in cancer operations. That's another reality, another impact of this virus, a dreadful impact, and one that no one could fully appreciate unless it happens to you or a loved one. The Minister has identified a regional approach to urgent life-saving operations, not just confined to cancers, he has also secured, he is told, as 112 theatre spaces in the private sector over coming weeks. Robin Swan is not a callous individual taking pleasure from the suffering of others. He must have. Sorry? Yes? I agree entirely that Robin is not a callous individual. I think he's, I think he's a very decent man. I asked my question earlier on and he didn't answer it. Perhaps you could answer it, Alan. I asked why, instead of the trusts announcing that cancer surgery was going to be cancelled, did he not first of all scope out what capacity there was in the private sector and ensure that those individuals who have a cancer diagnosis weren't kicked in the teeth again? 
The Minister didn't answer that earlier. Thank you. I would have every confidence uh, that he did scope out uh, those figures that, uh, that you talk about. But I know that Robin Swan must, he must have many sleepless nights wrestling uh, with this uh, situation. And our National Health Service was in a bad place before Robin Swan took up the health portfolio. Our waiting lists, including cancer operations, were the longest in the United Kingdom. Perhaps if those of, uh, those of us who sat in this House in previous mandates had properly funded the NHS, we would be in a better place today to cope with this pandemic. My colleague, uh, Jonathan Buckley, and I, I recognise and, and admire the passion that he brought to the debate today, has highlighted the flaws in the crafting of restrictions. And there are, there are obvious flaws and contradictions, and you know, they're hard to defend at times when people challenge you about them. But I hope also that Jonathan recognises that his party has four voices within the executive, and that's the place to highlight the flaws, to correct the flaws, to change them. And we talk, uh, I'm just finishing, uh, uh, Jonathan. In, in relation to uh, vaccines, you know, we've talked, and there's a lot of talk about, let's ramp it up to 24 7, let's get more vaccinators. But we're getting told by the professionals, I, I, I don't know, are people not listening? We're getting told that the vaccination program is dictated by the availability of the vaccine. And we're not at that place yet where we can offer a 24-7 uh, service. That is another reality that we all need to recognise. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It has been well uh, laid out today about the the true cost of this pandemic, uh, not just those who have died as a result of COVID-19. Uh, there are also many who have been left with long-term illness, uh, long COVID, uh, and that will test our health service very much in the time ahead. We've also heard about those in particular who have received cancer diagnoses and have been told that uh, emergency surgery for them is going to be cancelled. And it was very worrying to hear the, one of the chief executives of, of one of the trusts last week in the health committee tell us that uh, in some cases, in some individual patients, by the time they do get the treatment they need, the cancer will already have spread. You know, and imagine the devastation in the first place of getting a cancer diagnosis, and then, to be followed up with that news. Uh, and I know patients are being offered uh, chemotherapy uh, as, as a sort of suboptimal treatment uh, while they wait for the potential or the possibility of, of getting uh, surgery. So uh, then on top of that, we have the issue of, of mental ill health and the people who are struggling badly with their mental health uh, as a result of, of this pandemic and of the lockdowns and, and so on and so forth. But I, I want to give a special mention to our frontline care workers because I was speaking to an ICU nurse just yesterday who was telling me that of a group of 15 nurses, eight of them have to take sleeping tablets because of the images in their, in their minds that won't allow them to sleep at night. Uh, and imagine the impact that is going to have on the resilience of the health service in the time ahead. Uh, you know, and, and, and all the problems, and there are many, many more uh, issues that could be spoken about here today. But perhaps that about those nurses is probably the most worrying you know, that you can think of. Those nurses who are right at the very front line, the people who are on ventilators in ICU, and those nurses are struggling uh, in dealing with those patients. And these uh, restrictions, and we've been here 
many times now uh, discussing these regulations. Sorry, uh, and the whole aim of the regulations is to reduce the rate of the virus transmitting in the community, or it may be at certain times when the transmission rate is low. It's about easing some of the restrictions uh, that have been introduced. Now, the difficulty uh, for me in all of this is that that's not a strategy. These regulations are not a strategy. And the, the health minister said last week in the committee that his objective in all of this is to keep the R rate below one. Now, that in itself, to me, is not a very ambitious objective. Uh, but even by his own standards, if that is his objective, he has failed and failed miserably. And that's why we're in the situation we're in today. That's why there are more patients than ever in hospital. That's why there are higher rates of transmission than there have ever been at any time since this pandemic started. And, you know, I believe you need a clear objective. And when you have a clear objective, you then build a strategy to try and reach that objective. And you use whatever measures or tools you have at your disposal to try and bring you through that strategy and through strategic objectives to bring you to your overall objective. Now, the help. Sure, yeah. Would the member agree that that would include medics from the British Army? Well, uh, you'll recall, Alan, that I said in the health committee last week, I welcome help from wherever it comes. People wanted to focus on, on other elements of what I said, but I thought it would have, would have been a significant story that a former member of the IRA, ex-political prisoner and hunger striker, said he had no issue about British soldiers coming to work in our hospitals. So, uh, you know, maybe you, you, that would have been newsworthy, but maybe not. But in any event, we were talking about strategies. And the health minister said in a, situation, in a, uh, in a session there earlier on that it wasn't his responsibility to bring forward a strategy. It was the responsibility of the executive. So just let me read this out from the first day brief to the health committee. It's under section 3.8, emergency planning. 3.8, under the NI Civil Contingencies Framework 2011, the department has been identified as the lead government department for responding to the health and social care consequences of emergencies arising from chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear incidents, disruptions to the medical supply chain, human infectious diseases, e.g. pandemic influenza, and mass casualties. 3.9, this requires the department to not only develop and maintain appropriate emergency plans and response arrangements to manage its own response to an emergency, and that of its associated agencies and NDPBs, but also to coordinate the interagency aspects of civil protection for those emergencies for which it has been designated lead. In such circumstances, the minister would be required to lead, direct, and coordinate the response for NI, reporting as necessary to the executive under the Northern Ireland Central Crisis Management Arrangements. Now, that tells me the responsibility for developing plans and developing a strategy to combat this virus rests with the Department of Health, and particularly with the Minister of Health. It's also the responsibility of the Department of Health to provide advice. And I still can't get my head around the advice that was given to the executive just before Christmas in regard to travel from London. Matt Hancock had told us the virus was out of control in the south of England. The new variant had become dominant. 
In fact, we were being told uh, there were probably one person in 40 in London infected with this virus, and in some parts of London, the infection rates were as high as one person in 30. But it was okay to jump on a plane at Heathrow, hop off at Belfast City and go about your business, get into a taxi, train, bus, go into the city centre and do your shopping or whatever. A plane holds 160 passengers. If there's one in 40 in the south east of England infected with the virus, I mean, it doesn't take you to be Einstein to work out the maths and the probability of that. There's probably four people who are infected coming in on every flight from the south of England. Sure not. And he articulates his point quite well, and I know this is something that he has long since uh, debated on. But following that same logic, would the member agree when we look to the Republic of Ireland and we've seen what was described as some of the highest rates in Europe, would he equally call for uh, an equitable approach south-north in relation to COVID-19 spread? I'll, I'll come to that point in a minute, if you, if you let me finish the point that I was going to make. So, what's the point of us trying to reduce community transmission? And bear in mind, I see this as a contract with the citizens out there. We introduce the, these regulations and restrictions, which are often quite draconian, on the basis that if they do what we ask them to do, we will do our best to protect them and to save lives and to ensure our health service isn't overwhelmed and so forth and so on. But what's the point of us doing that, trying to reduce community transmission here? If we're going to open the door and welcome the virus in on plane loads of people coming in to Belfast City, to Aldergrove, to Derry, wherever, what is the point? And the advice that was given to the executive by the minister, the chief scientific advisor, and the chief medical officer was that that did not pose a significant risk. That is arrant nonsense. And I don't care who the scientist, scientist is. Let them get up and explain how it's not a significant risk, because it is. On the issue of the South, let me just say this. First of all, there's one advantage that many people or many countries have, and it's just by accident. It's a geographical uh, 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 accident that some countries are islands, and many of those islands are the ones that have performed best in the whole of this pandemic, because they can control entry into their country. Places like New Zealand, Australia, a continental island, albeit, Taiwan, Iceland, and so on. And they have all done better because they have a small number of points of entry where the virus can be controlled. Here, come from London, jump off, go about your business. No checks, no restrictions, nothing. And that's a problem. And it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter how low we got to community transmission. If we're still importing the virus, then we're still going to have problems. And I don't care whether it's London or Paris or Timbuktu. If we are going to import this virus, we are going to continually be in this situation where we impose lockdowns, we get the, the transmission rates down, we open up, and the thing goes through the roof again, just as it has done this time. So, <clears throat> there has been talk about uh, zero COVID. And people say, but oh, you can't get the zero. And people say, you can't eradicate the virus. And that's absolutely true. We cannot eradicate this virus. That's impossible. And it's going to be with us for many years to come. The chief scientific officer has said, or chief scientific advisor has said, 
Uh, rather than being pandemic, it's going to become endemic. It's always going to be there, like the flu virus. Uh, and so we have to deal with that. Uh, and there are ways we can deal with it. And vaccination is, of course, one of the tools uh, at our disposal. But what's more important, in my view, and I mean, people were thinking once the vaccinations arrived, we're going to be out of the woods by Easter or maybe late spring or early summer. Uh, uh, and I doubt if anyone sitting in this chamber today now expects that. And there are going to be problems with vaccinations. We've seen the issue of new variants arising. Uh, funny enough, just go back to what I was saying there earlier, I just see uh, some stuff today saying that the, the Kent variant, as they're calling it, the UK variant, uh, is running at 68% of all cases here in the North now. I wonder, has that anything to do with people jumping on and off planes uh, coming in here? The, uh, the, and it, it, it's certainly concerning that other variants uh, are arising. And if you listen to any of the scientists or public health people who have expertise in this field, the virologists, the epidemiologists, and so on, the greater the community transmission rates, the greater the chance of mutation. And the great fear in all of this is that we get a mutation which becomes resistant to the virus. And of course, many of the manufacturers say, well, we can deal with that, we can tweak the vaccine. But that's going to take time. Uh, they're going to not only have to tweak the vaccine, they're going to have to reboot their whole manufacturing process uh, and so on and so forth. So anybody thinks this is going to be resolved in a few weeks or a few months, uh, I would say uh, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. So, what do we need? We need a coherent, coordinated, and integrated strategy to deal with this virus. We need to find the virus. We need to have proper contact tracing. We had an opportunity uh, after the first lockdown when numbers were very, very low during the summer to build a proper contact tracing operation. That opportunity was wasted. The chief medical officer told the committee that they had four to 600 offers for people to be trained to do contact tracing. He said there were people actually being trained in enhanced contact tracing. Let's come back to April, April the 23rd, I think it was, or the 24th, I'm not sure which. The chief executive of the public health agency told us at uh, the end of April also, or the middle of April, that they were currently training, and those are her words, currently training 500 people to carry out contact tracing. She came back three weeks later, and when her words were, were from Hansard were read back to her, she admitted that she had spoken out of turn. Those are the opportunities that were wasted. There was actually nobody being trained. There was no beefing up or ramping up of the contact tracing operation. And when the chief executive of the PHA came back in in October and told us they had 151 contact tracers, when asked what did that amount to in full-time equivalents, she couldn't give us an answer. She later, we later found out it was actually 88. When we asked her why the numbers were so low in comparison to what she had been talking about in the spring, she said, the experts who did the modeling about the number of positive cases we should expect got the modeling wrong. They told us, they told us just to expect 300 cases maximum a day. And so they didn't beef up their uh, contact tracing as a result uh, of that modeling that was given them. Who was the modeling done by? According to the chief executive of the PHA, it was done by 
Professor Ian Young, the Chief Scientific Advisor. When the Chief Scientific Advisor was at the committee a couple of weeks ago, I asked him about this. Uh, how, how come they had made such a mess of the modeling? How come they got it so wrong? He said, well, we didn't get it wrong. We told the PHA they expect up to 1,300 cases a day. So I don't know who's right and who's wrong. Uh, whoever's sitting here today can make up their own mind on that. But what it tells me is this whole operation and dealing with this pandemic has been absolutely shambolic. There's no other word to describe it. So we need a clear objective and we need a strategy, a coordinated an integrated strategy, and somebody has to take responsibility. And at the minute, the health minister is abdicating his responsibility. And if the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer are going to give advice, let it be based on science. Do you want me to make it? Okay. I guess initiate him, Sir Cara Hunter. On can I call Cara Hunter? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I would like to begin uh, my remarks today by taking the opportunity to thank the public uh, for all that they have done and the sacrifices that they have made over the past 10 months as we continue to do all we can um, to beat this virus. Um, as we discuss Amendment 19 to 25, I am sure that the recent news um, that the lockdown will now be extended until early March was met with many sighs and heavy hearts. And whilst we all across this chamber recognise the need for continued restrictions at this time uh, and we support uh, the executive in this difficult decision, we are very mindful of the impact that this pandemic has had and will continue to have for the foreseeable months on our constituents, not least in terms of the emotional impact and being socially isolated. Sadly, the sacrifices which have been made for the greater good have come at a very personal cost. For many of the most vulnerable people in our communities, during the pandemic, their life has consisted only between four walls. Many experienced a very, very lonely Christmas, making sacrifices this year so that the next will be very different. As I have said here before, as have many other passionate members, the after effects on mental health and well-being will be felt long after this pandemic has passed. Mr Middleton, although he's not here at the minute, mentioned previous uh, on a call that we had earlier this week with the Western Trust, uh, the very worrying statistic um, that 12 per cent more people are presenting themselves uh, at mental health services, and that's deeply concerning and deeply worrying. But I believe, uh, as other members do, it's on us as MLAs and the executive to commit to ensuring that the support is and will continue, continue to be there for those in need of help and support, particularly after this very traumatic time. These last 10 months have been very difficult for all aspects of society. And I think one thing that Mr Middleton had touched on earlier as well is in previous uh, health amendments we had discussed uh, funerals. Uh, and it's a very difficult time uh, to have a funeral at, at the moment. You know, I think here in the north, the, the aspect of having wakes, it, engaging with our community and grief, um, and that support system isn't there. Um, so just to talk, speaking to, directly to the public, uh, I urge those who are suffering from bereavement to seek that really crucial um, support and to seek counselling. But I must also pay tribute to the NHS staff uh, who, as we speak, are facing some of the most difficult times that they ever have or ever will in their work. We are greatly indebted to them and hope that with further restrictions in place, we will start to see a fall in infection rates and people needing hospital care, and in turn, less pressure on frontline staff and the health system, similarly to all those involved in the vaccination programme. The success which it is having is remarkable, and it is heartening to see the figures every day uh, for those getting the vaccine. I think currently 10.5% of the adult population uh, is, is vaccinated, and this is most welcome with the first vaccine. Um, as we look into more weeks of businesses having to stay closed, I would call on the executive to act quickly to extend current schemes and to help those business owners who are reliant on this money to keep businesses afloat. Something else which I hear a lot of from my constituents is around Amendment 21, 21 and the need uh, due to the, the, clo the closure of uh, entertainment venues, the need for more support for entertainers, singers and musicians. Um, having no social events such as weddings has caused great difficulty. The pandemic has meant that this industry has had a very hard time. So I do look forward uh, in the coming days and weeks uh, to learning what further consideration is being given uh, to provide support for this sector. 
While I appreciate that swift action needs to be taken by the Executive when it comes to decisions around regulations and lockdown, I do still think that the Assembly should have some more time for discussion on it. These motions before us today were all made uh, you know, between the 10th and the 29th of December. That's over one month ago. Uh, I would also note that it seems we are too often learning uh, about decisions made through the Executive through the media as opposed to being properly informed and briefed on any changes in policy or extensions to restrictions ourselves. Finally, Mr Speaker, I will conclude my remarks today by once again thanking frontline staff for all they are doing in this fight. We are all very grateful. And I would also like to continue to urge the public to adhere to the current guidelines and regulations, as difficult as that may be. The vaccine rollout is giving us all hope that the end is that little bit closer, but it is more important now than ever that we do not give up and undo all the good sacrifices that have been made over the last year. Lastly, today a lot of political angles have been discussed, and that could be something that I could indulge in, but I would like to shift to a very important uh, topic as I finish. Uh, Mr Buckley had mentioned very passionately about his deep concern about uh, cancer surgeries being uh, cancelled. I think I absolutely agree. It is very concerning. Cancer is a very uh, deeply emotional and raw topic to discuss. Uh, I share my deep concern. Two years ago, uh, my father had had a radical robotic prostatectomy with the Western Trust. Uh, the cancer care he had received was absolutely fantastic. But we often talk about if it was in 2021 and he had had this diagnosis and needed that crucial surgery, it would be a very different conversation. So I share deep concern, and I think this is something at the committee that we should really further discuss. Um, but no, just to close in saying I'd like to thank the public for their continued efforts uh, and the health staff for their hard work. Thank you. No, I'm not down to speak. Sorry, no comment. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, do you know what? If the public is listening to this um, this evening, they would be more depressed than ever. Um, it has been hard listening to some of you tonight. I don't know how you can make a pandemic a green and orange issue, but can we please just knock it in the head? Um, a lot of the um, regulations that we're talking about here, as many others have said, take us up to the end of December. And can I just thank both of the junior ministers for bringing this forward and the health minister and the whole executive, because I had give out that a lot of these regulations were taking an extraordinary amount of time to get to this house. And do you know what? That's not bad, bad going. You know, we're only back um, after the Christmas recess period, even though we're here quite a lot. Um, and we're up to number 25. And I know we're already into the 2021 regulations, but we're not that far behind. So thank you very much for bringing these forward. Um, I know it's hard for you to sit there and listen to quite a lot of stuff. I know I'm a, a member of a party that's part of the five-party executive, to be honest. Somebody talked earlier, I think it was Mr Buckley, had mentioned about being motivated. I don't know how the executive are staying motivated because this has been the toughest time in politics. And I think we need to just take a wee moment just to catch ourselves on here. We have an executive that is exhausted. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm exhausted. My family are exhausted and the public are exhausted. We need to bring people with us. They don't need to hear negativity coming out of this chamber. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but mental health has me massively concerned. And I know that um, the Regulation 25, the last one that's on the list here today, um, close contact services were closed. Do you know what? I need my hair cut. Um, we have others here. Um, Mr Middleton needs his 12 red roses for Valentine's Day. There's a lot of points of contact that have been talked about that we're missing. Um, and that mental health is really struggling. Others have talked about schools. I have teenagers who are now saying to me they want to repeat a school year. Have you ever heard of young people talking about wanting to go to another year at school? That's how bad it is. So we need to give them something to look forward to. We know over Christmas, isolated older people, it really got to them. As others have said, it was a very quiet Christmas. Their mental health is a problem maternity services. We are creating a wee bomb that is ready to go off in about six months or a year's time with all of those women who go through birth without their birthing partner being there for the whole period of time. And for those, unfortunately, like myself, who've been through miscarriage or stillbirth, uh -uh, we can't do this anymore. So we have a lot of people who are at breaking point, this mental health. 
A lot of people today have talked about those frontline carers. Thank you for that. And I want to thank each and every carer who's been out there knocking their pants and helping people to their own detriment, to their own mental health. But I'd just like to make a point today. When we talk about those frontline carers, there are one group of carers that are completely left out. And they're not mentioned in the regulations, and they're never considered when it comes to giving out money. And that's those home carers, the people who are looking after the elderly and the disabled, who are at home, who haven't had a break in a year. These are people who are not getting any money thrown at them. They didn't have a carers allowance increase. They haven't had the £500 that's been thrown at people in, in Scotland. These are people who are at breaking point, who have no respite. And they need clarification when it comes to the vaccine. We know that the JCVI have said that in Group 6 that they are part of the people who will get a vaccine. But our GP surgeries don't know this. So when a carer phones up to make sure that they're registered on their medical records as being a carer, some GPs are saying, but carers aren't getting this vaccine. That's not true. The JCVI have already confirmed this. In fact, I'm delighted today to say that the update is that 182, over 182,000 people have had their first vaccines. That's fantastic. But when it comes to the mental health, what I would say to the junior ministers to take it back to the executive is we have teenagers, we have isolated older people, we have pregnant women and their, their partners, we have carers that are breaking point, and the key thread that's going through this is their mental health. And when I say that we need a clear COVID recovery strategy, and we need to see this starting to be built through the regulations, it's not to go back to what it was before, but to actually go forward to help people to come out of this. Money is still not getting through to businesses. Large retailers, I know a lot of people talk about the independent retailers, but large retailers have closed, costing us 700 jobs. When Debenhams went, it wasn't just a few people. There were a lot of people who lost jobs. And as Ms Hunter had mentioned, events companies, the arts, sports, all of them need help. All have had impacts through these regulations. We need to start to think out of this. It's not going to be today or tomorrow or Easter or the summer. I don't know when it's going to be. And I don't think anybody out there in the community would thank us for putting a date that is then broken. But we need to start planning ahead. Unlike Mr Chambers, I believe that preparation is key here. I think that we can help to bring people with us if we give them a plan, if we show them that there's something for the future. The vaccine does this, but only in part because it's the mental health. What are we going to say to those mothers who haven't had any support? Did you know, for instance, in this house that Cruise Bereavement Care does not receive funding for that mental health of, of mothers? I know that the Minister for Health the other day had mentioned that there would be perinatal mental health money, but it's not there now. It's, it's something that's thought about for the future. We need to think about this. And very, very a key one in this is our, our children. They are starting to struggle. They have lost their motivations, as others have said. So we need to give them something positive to look forward to. Telling them that they don't have exams coming up isn't something that's positive. They miss all of that. So we need to give them something a bit clear. And I think a clear COVID recovery strategy would help. The other thing I would like to see, and I'm going to say to the ministers, please, will you take this back? I'm fed up asking the executive for this. Can we have a point of contact for the department so that we can get through to them? I am sick to the back teeth of writing to a minister looking for a point of contact, only to be given the same point of contact as everybody else, and the phones are never answered. We need to be able to speak on behalf of businesses, for those people who have mental health problems, for people who are trying to find out about vaccines. Now, I know that they're not to phone their GPs, and I would never ask anyone to do that. But we do need those contact details, and maybe the public need clear information as well. The silent majority that are out there, that are complying with the regulations, that have complied with 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, they've complied with them the whole way through. They will still continue to comply. Perhaps it's time in those regulations that we start to think about bringing forward regulations that say to those who don't comply, the fines will get worse. The fake news providers, and I don't know about the rest of you in this house, but as an MLA, I am sick to the back teeth of getting emails from people saying you must read this book about COVID is, is a load of rubbish. COVID's not the cause of everything. COVID's just made up by government to control us all. I even had a church pastor write to me saying that I was a disgrace because people weren't going to that person's church. Now, most of churches do come back and have kept within the regulations. 
But all I will ask you is, can we please have a little bit more clarification in future regulations? Please go back and talk to the executive and say to them, while we have caught up, we have almost caught up with the regulations that have been issued to date, we need to stop the tit for tat and we need to give people hope and we need to start to bring people with us and we need a COVID recovery strategy, not as Mr Chambers has said, where it needs to be back to what we're used to a year ago. Who would have thought a year ago we would have knew what the R number meant? But it's for a new future, for what that new dawn is going to be like when people can finally go back out of their house again. Because you see those isolated older people, the people who were closed down over Christmas because of those regulations, some of them are very scared about going outside. And we need to help them access services, especially when it comes to improving their mental health. Thank you. Justin McNulty, I call Justin. I can thank the junior minister for bringing these regulations to the House today. As I sit and listen to the valuable contributions of all members this evening, the words of a, a friend of mine are resonating in my ears. Last March, when we were all getting to grips with the arrival of this new virus, this new pandemic, I reached out to a trusted friend, Dr. Jerry McEntee, a back-to-back -back winner of an all Ireland's in the 1980s with me, but also a renowned surgeon in the Matter Hospital in Dublin for over 30 years. I wanted the medical steer and what he thought about this pandemic. Jerry said to me, Justin, when this is all over and done with, people you know and people I know will be dead. And sadly, how right Jerry was, even though it was hard to comprehend at that time how right Jerry was. And people we all know have passed on. It's very sad. And it's coincidentally, Sean Boylan, his great manager, actually contracted COVID as well, but thankfully he has fought through. So I acknowledge the stark necessity for these regulations. At the time of their introduction, they were necessary both to protect, protect public health and to protect our health services. And we all have to acknowledge these restrictions are not what we want. They place extraordinary, ex extraordinary curtailments on our economy, our way of life, and on our basic liberties. But before I do go any further, I do want to again put my sincere thanks and appreciation on record for our health, social care, and frontline workers across our society, especially in the health, education, frontline services and essential retail. Sadly, until this virus hit our world, much of the work these people did was taken for granted. May that never be the case again. We should not just thank these people, we should, almost, we should revere them. Like many in this House, I've sat in on uh, many meetings in recent weeks and months with health officials. I have heard from them and indeed those healthcare workers on the front line of the very real pressures on them as they battle to save every life. I spoke with the Chief Executive Shane Devlin of the Southern Trust last week, a week when 40 per cent of all people in hospital with COVID in the north were in the Southern Trust hospital. The Director of Acute Services told me that the staff have been fabulous, resilient and gracious. They are really feeling the pressure and are completely shattered, but they are facing the challenge head on. They are extraordinary, those people. I have spoken to heartbroken families who are distraught. Others have lost loved ones. Others have people of loved ones in the hospital that they cannot visit. I've spoken to families who have lost loved ones to this horrible disease and they are beside themselves with the pain and the grief because they haven't been able to say their goodbyes and, their, and to share their grief in their special Irish way. And I know too many families who have lost, lost both parents to this horrible virus. So whilst these restrictions are not normal, nor is the virus, while many of these restrictions are seen 
as reasonable and justified. There are many others which people out there are questioning. In questioning the, the, the restrictions, they are not challenging the advice, but they're just looking and seeking clarity and need to know why certain restrictions are in place. For example, why is outdoor sport for young people not permitted? Children have been taken out of school, and if we are to protect their physical and emotional well-being, surely organised and managed outdoor sports should be considered. I know I have had parents of young people plea for their children to be permitted to participate in sport, and yes, the restrictions and regulations must be adhered with, but allowing some limited sport and recreation can and will protect mental health and well-being of young people now and into the future. Why are car washes closed? Surely keeping cars clean, headlights clean, is a good thing. We've kept mechanics open, MOT centres open and operating, yet some cannot get their car washed. So-called essential, sorry, so-called non-essential retailers close, and yet essential retailers can sell items which are deemed non-essential. Surely that isn't fair. Items such as hot tubs or electrical goods, some electrical goods. This favours the big retail giants that does nothing for small independent retailers in our town centres who before this pandemic were fighting for the very survival. Count Corla, we have seen the impact of COVID, the impact of COVID on our communities, not just as an outcome of these restrictions, but the death toll, the number of people impacted, schooling from home, large parts of our economy have been put in cold storage. So we need a plan for recovery. A plan for the recovery and reopening of our education and health services. I've mentioned many times I do believe those in education need to be prioritised in terms of vaccination, especially those in special education um, settings. We need a plan that ensures children who are falling further behind can catch up a plan that ramps up capacity in healthcare to tackle the ever-growing waiting lists and to tackle the hidden health consequences of the pandemic and the various lockdowns. A plan for mental health recovery, a plan for physical health recovery, a plan for emotional health recovery and renewal. We need to see a plan for economic recovery and renewal. We need to see a plan for rebooting our tourism and hospitality sectors. We need to see a plan to get sport back on the pitch. We need a plan for emotional health and well-being renewal. Count Coral, like many in this House and in our communities, I want to see restrictions eased and life return to normal, as normal as possible, whatever that normal might look like after this pandemic. But we do need to adhere by the public guidance and by what the experts say. And someone once said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Let's all keep going. Gura Mayogut, come Curla. Gura Mayogut, thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the junior ministers for the outline of the regulations in front of us today. And I do welcome the opportunity to speak on this debate. And like others have done, for pay tribute to our frontline and healthcare staff who work extremely hard under immense pressure and stress. And I also want to mention that Kelly Armstrong has those family and home carers too that are often hidden. And I also extend my thoughts to families and friends suffering with the passing of their loved ones and those who are unwell. But these regulations are to be expected. We were warned that infection rates would rise and our health service would become dangerously overwhelmed. Around the middle of December, there were on average around 500 positive tests per day, according to Department of Health figures. And by the 27th of December, this had doubled to just over 1,000 per day. And on the 29th of December, there were 2,300 positive COVID, COVID test results. In the week commencing the 28th, over 12,000 people tested positive for COVID-19. The previous week, there were just 5,000. How did this happen? And what were the executive doing about it? At the beginning of December, the executive agreed what they called the Christmas household bubbling arrangements from December 23rd to the 27th. And they also announced that non-essential shops and services would reopen from the 11th of December. And the First Minister said, 
Through our collective efforts over recent weeks, we have gained enough space in the transmission of the virus to relax a significant number of restrictions, including the opening up of non-essential retail, close contact services, sport and leisure activities and our places of worship. These decisions will give families, businesses and employees some much needed certainty and comfort in the run up to Christmas and beyond. But there was little comfort in those words for those working in our health service. As scientists and medical professionals point out at that time, transmission of the virus remains steady and the lifting of restrictions could only have one one effect on its spread to allow the virus to circulate even more widely. Professor Gabriel Skelly said back then, I think with Christmas coming up, people will see this as permission to do lots of things they haven't been able to do. And a lot of those situations, whether it be restaurants, whether it be a lot of crowd shopping, all of that will just feed the virus and the numbers will go up. And similar concerns were raised by others, such as Dr Tom Black of the BNA. Time and time again, we were told the executive's decision to reopen non-essential retail or non-essential services before Christmas and their easing of restrictions to allow for social mixing over five days during the festive period set us on the course for the crisis point that we're experiencing at present. The result was entirely predictable, yet we ploughed on. After less than a week of relaxing restrictions came a completely different message. On the 17th of December, the executive then agreed a full lockdown to come into effect from Boxing Day. The Deputy First Minister said the health service would be completely crushed in January if we didn't intervene now. So while this is draconian, it's about saving lives. We've never been in such a bad position as we are now and will be in January if this doesn't happen. But let's think about that for a moment. On the 4th of December, the First Minister said that we'd gained enough space in the transmission of the virus to relax a number of restrictions and it would provide much needed certainty and comfort. But less than a fortnight later, the Deputy First Minister said that we've never been in such a bad position. When the new variant began to cause widespread panic on the 19th, Minister suggested that people should only consider mixing on one day over Christmas, now outlined in Amendments 22 onwards that we're dealing with today. But it wasn't formally agreed by the executive until the 21st, communicated via a press release published just after 1.30 a.m. They advised against non-essential travel. But like many decisions and messaging from this, it was too little too late and sent many people into a panic who had arrived home to Northern Ireland but were due to go back to university or maybe where they had lived or made that horrible decision but necessary to cancel their visits to their families at Christmas. We were all contacted throughout the holidays, with many people panicking that their children, say for example, could not get home, that they would be turned away from the boat. When you examine the regulations and the amendments before us today, what do they show? Amendments 19 to 25 tell a story, and they illustrate precisely the problems that the executive has had in dealing with the pandemic and the inability to get on top of this crisis. We are debating here amendments to regulations that were brought in to ease restrictions and also that constitute the shutting down of society and and economy. And again, as Colin McGrath had said, this is rather convoluted, if not highly confusing. How many more lockdowns will there be? How many more blows will be suffered by people who have struggled financially and emotionally throughout this pandemic? The approach has been inconsistent and incoherent, and the regulations paint that picture very clearly. The published plans and frameworks for decision making, for easing and tightening restrictions, and we didn't follow them. Ministers argued and fought about reopening non-essential services that would increase transmission of the virus, and then, faced with the complete implosion of our health service, rushed to backtrack and impose tighter restrictions. The competing priorities of each of the executive parties has been compounded attempts to deal with COVID-19 and there has been a failure in the most basic duty to communicate simple, consistent messages to the public and give relevant information. One day we've got room to relax. Less than two weeks later, we have arrived at our worst point. You can mix with other households for several days over Christmas. Sorry, no, just one 24-hour period. Travel only if it's necessary, but there will be no restrictions other than that in and out of Tier 4 in England. All in Amendment 22, as outlined, and 23. Confusion, mixed messaging and even simply no or very little information are all recurring themes and we continue to find out what has been or will be discussed by the executive through Twitter or Facebook posts by journalists. As MLAs, we are not given the information to answer to our constituents' questions, but perhaps it's just those in the opposition.
But I appreciate that this is a very fast-moving picture, but people deserve information to get their questions answered, or at least to have an avenue to do so. And I fully support the call of Kelly Armstrong earlier on for a single point of contact for MLAs to utilise to get answers that our constituents need. And I will repeat yet again for my call for press conferences to be more regular, but specifically, when will the executive ministers conduct youth press conference? I have written to the First and Deputy First Minister twice, Minister twice now, both unanswered, not to mention the written questions on this, but when will children and young people get their questions answered? Today, the Education Minister launched the Northern Ireland Executive's Children and Young People Strategy 2020 to 2030. One aspect of this apparently stresses the importance of allowing children and young people opportunities to participate in society and have their voice heard and views represented, specifically on issues that affect them. Where is their ongoing opportunity during this most uncertain of years in their lives, dealing with massive changes and ongoing restrictions? Worst of all is the underlying tone evident in some communications that ordinary people are to blame for the virus getting out of control. As the Dean and Vice Dean of the Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine in England noted, a troubling narrative now appears to have crept into some reporting of intensive care bed shortages to blame the public. Our NHS staff are struggling. They are frustrated, stressed and stretched beyond what we can only imagine, and they have every right to be angry with those that flout the rules. But it is not a few reckless individuals or young people that are responsible for the near collapse of our health service. It is not the whole public's fault that hundreds of people have had their cancer surgery cancelled last week. The BMA's Medical Ethics Committee pointed out, rather than blame the public, we should focus on how the timing and communication of restrictions have contributed to the current situation. We are also dealing with a variant that makes the virus more transmissible, which is especially dangerous for those living in areas of social deprivation where infection spreads more easily. Fundamentally, however, it is the chronic underfunding and lack of resources in the NHS that are driving staff to breaking point, not the public, who are doing everything they can to prevent our beloved health service from going under. There has been a failure to deliver an effective test, track and trace isolate system that actually compensates people who miss out from lost income. I have, sure like others, have had constituents contacting me, telling me that they were turned down for support, even for grants that are set up for them to apply for, being told that they're not eligible. And as an assembly, we need to protect the most vulnerable, people who cannot afford to self-isolate, people who have missed out on forms of financial assistance for their, building, for their business or livelihood. And as I have said, restrictions before us today were to be expected. We were warned that infection rates would rise and that our health service would become dangerously overwhelmed, but it didn't have to be this way. This pandemic is far from over. And what we need above all, Mr Speaker, is a clear and consistent approach to deal with this crisis. No more confusion, no more ambiguity or toing and froing from pandering to populism. We must get on top of this once and for all. There has been too much unnecessary suffering already. The executive must get support to those who need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't think for one moment that there's anything but extreme difficulty for any government in dealing with this pandemic, uh, and I think that's the same for Stormont government as it is for anywhere else. But those difficulties are nothing compared with the difficulties that our health service have had to cope with. And uh, I think I want to join with others in saluting the dedication uh, and call beyond duty uh, of so many across that service. Though I acknowledge it's difficult to deal with the pandemic from a government perspective. I think this government in the executive has had a number of steps and missteps which have compounded those difficulties. I think one of those is the flip-flop in the announcements. Uh, Ms. Woods has articulated some of them. Um, you know, November, we were told two weeks, 
that will do it. Then uh, Christmas, five days. No, it's one day. Then it will all be over, or, or this, this current uh, lockdown will last to the 5th of March, or to the uh, 6th of February. Now it's the 5th of March. And I think that's leaving a public not just increasingly frustrated, but increasingly questioning whether some of those in charge actually know what they're doing. And I think the real issue that brings this to the fore is the matter concerning what the public were told was the key determinant here. The public for months was told it's the R number. Stupid. If we can get the R number down, before, down below 1, then we can ease things. Now the public has been told, well, the R number is below 1, but we are going to extend the lockdown from February to March. Where did the benchmarking to the R number go? I think the public are entitled to ask and to have that question answered. Does the R number not matter anymore? Yes, I understand the delay in working through the system of rising infections, rising hospital admissions and rising deaths with a falling R number. But if, and there seems to be, there is that conjoinder between a rising R number and rising cases, and a falling R number and falling cases, then surely as we go forward with a falling R number, we should be anticipating a fall in the demands on our hospital admissions. And we do know that there has been a fall, thankfully, in the number of positive COVID tests. So the lag for that, it works both ways. The lag now, hopefully, is working in the opposite direction. But the lockdown isn't. The lockdown, we've just been told, is reaching into March. And I think it's issues like that that add to the scepticism of a public. Yes, I understand our hospitals have to be able to cope I'm not going to labour the point, but I will make it again, that if under devolution we had looked after our hospitals instead of taking out 2,000 beds since 2007 and all the attendant staff that go with it, we would be in a lot better position to cope. I understand that, but when the R number is falling, surely the admissions are projected to fall and happily the deaths projected to fall. And yet we are projecting extension. Why is that? And what, what about all the talk we had before Christmas from the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister? We have to learn to live with this virus. That's the sort of flip-flopping that I'm referring to in terms of the message, never mind even going to issues such as the catastrophic impact on messaging of the story funeral. So I think those are some of the problems that the executive has had. But the other dimension of public disquiet from what I hear from my constituents arises in the disparate treatment of businesses. This point that some have made in this debate, that if you are a large supermarket, you can be open, but if you are a small retailer, not predominantly selling essential goods, you will be closed. So the draper who can sell predominantly clothing is closed, but you can walk into Marks and Spencers and kit yourself out in all their vast range of clothing. That is what really irks with so many small businesses on our high street. Yes, I'll give Thank the member for giving way. And on that point, would he acknowledge also that in many of the small independent retailers, the ability to actually social distance 
through uh, an appointment basis makes it a much safer environment than those that go for their jolly shop in Marks and Spencers and then venture on into uh, the clothing sections they're in. The member's absolutely right. And, you know, if, if I think of the main town in my constituency of Palomina, we have a range store. Now, range sells a vast range, essentially, of household matters. They sell some essentials like toiletries, etc. But the great predominant sales are in their household goods. The range is open. But wise buys. A local business, which also sells some toiletries, but which predominantly uh, is household goods, is closed. Not. Why is that? Why are those who would prima facie seem to be breaching the rules not enforced against? And does that simply mean that others should equally? Disavow the rules? Because that's the open invitation. Yes? Um, would you agree with me um, that there's. I, I have a, an example in my constituency where uh, home heating fuel, which is an essential business but has uh, a small car wash to the side, was fined by the police because it says that car washes can't open. Yet the multinational companies who do essential retail are allowed to sell their. Uh, unessential retail, which is also listed in the legislation, and that it really does make the small local business feel like it's one rule for the big companies and a different rule for them as the small local retailers. I agree absolutely. And if, if nothing is heard out of this debate but the pleas on behalf of small local business, then I hope that that at least will be heard, because it is imperative that either through proper enforcement or ironing out the wrinkles, let's be kind, of the regulations, so that there is not this disparity, until that is done, you are going to build a huge pond of resentment. You know, I'm getting correspondence all the time. Here's one here. A garden centre to help himself over the winter months. He sells a few bags of coal. It's had to be closed as a garden centre. Can't sell the coal. It's a minority interest. But the hardware store that can sell the coal can also sell the things that he would normally sell. The garden benches, all of that. Take another business. This one I see is from Miss Hunter's not here, but it's from her constituency of East Wanton Terry. A well established business telling how every lockdown has had a massive impact on local business, while the big multinationals appear to be able to trade without any impact on their business and are actually benefiting from local business being shut down. He says, I had to go into Asda last week for groceries. was completely shocked by the number of people in some aisles in the store, not buying groceries, buying other stock. And he made the point that someone else made, that in fact, local small businesses have a better opportunity uh, to properly control their customer input. So I do say to the executive, there has to be a readdressing of the disparity in this matter, which is becoming acute not just in its level of annoyance, but acute in its level of damage to the possibility of those businesses uh, surviving. So I do trust that junior ministers have been listening and that the next time we debate this, we won't have the same catalog of complaints about the prejudice to small business. Uh, and uh, if this debate serves any purpose, I trust that's the purpose it will serve. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Jerry Carroll.
Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I've been incredibly frustrated uh, for almost a year now by the way this executive has implemented regulations, not solely because I believe their strategy of living with COVID um, is utterly reckless, which I'll come on to, but because of this nonsense charade whereby we're expected to retrospectively give approval or discuss regulations that have long been uh, implemented, in some cases been out of date. Uh, there is no real semblance of uh, oversight or transparency or accountability, and the latest regulations are cooked up uh, behind closed doors, often diverging from health advice and pushed through without a picking of scrutiny. This is bad enough when governments around the world have been able to do this much more rigorously and effectively, uh, but when those regulations are actively allowing a deadly virus uh, to surge, when they are allowing for the criminalising of protests, uh, um, where, when they are putting workers at risk, the lack of accountability and scrutiny is totally negligent. It seems clear to everyone Mr. Speaker, that the current regulations will, will be extended to early March, if not be, uh, beyond. But when will we debate those decisions? April, May, when the regulations have already uh, been implemented? And why aren't we discussing on the floor, as others have alluded to uh, in the Assembly, the long term strategy uh, for dealing with this uh, virus? This charade and the strategy of the executive has left us with one of the worst records in the world at dealing with this virus, and it needs to end. The regulations, Mr. Speaker, in front of us today um, relate obviously to the Christmas period, uh, in some cases just before. Um, it's worth remembering that the, the Health Minister already has publicly admitted that the Executive got it wrong in terms of how it handled that period. Um, how many cases, I would ask, Mr. Speaker, uh, were unnecessarily contracted? How many people, uh, how many deaths uh, have occurred because of the decisions made by this Executive before the Christmas uh, period, which we are only able to discuss uh, some of them uh, today at the end of January? One of these amendments, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, allows for up to 500 people to attend uh, sporting events, and I have no doubt um, that sport uh, can help alleviate the, the pressure of isolation and COVID and lockdown generally. But it's utterly baffling to me, Mr Speaker, um, that the executive would permit such large-scale gathering while criminally punishing socially distant protests at the same time, such as the Black Lives Matter protests. Many people will be asking, have asked, where is the consistency? Where is the medical evidence which says that one gathering is permissible, permissible but the other uh, is not? The only discernible difference is that you pay into one event, but not uh, into a protest, never mind uh, questions around systemic racism. Amendment 25, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, Obviously, allowed taxi drivers to operate after eight o'clock uh, over the Christmas period, and I don't think anyone—I don't think anyone has—but I don't think anyone would oppose that. Um, but it is the case that some taxi drivers were approached by the PSNI uh, for doing so, um, some while transporting essential health care uh, workers home uh, and to work. Regulations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, have been rushed time and time again. Half the time, ministers aren't available on the airwaves or beyond uh, a quick, curt press uh, conference to explain the details, and many asking m multiple questions online and also of MLAs. People are relying on WhatsApp and Twitter uh, to understand the new rules, and it is clear to me that these regulations uh, weren't understood, uh, and taxi drivers were on the uh, receiving end of that. And they should not have been approached by the police, and certainly they have been through enough already. And too many are still struggling financially to have to deal with the extra pressure that they have faced. I think the key question uh, for the Minister today, Mr. Speaker, uh, is when will the executive learn, learn the lessons of this failed strategy of designing and rushed regulations behind closed doors, which risk the health uh, of workers' communities uh, by allowing the virus to continue to surge, then asking this Assembly to retrospectively give them uh, permission, the regulations permission. Unfortunately, I don't think I'm the only uh, person who doubts the lessons will be learned, and uh, that there has been uh, there has been consistent talk of individual responsibility and even a shameless attempt, Mr. Speaker, by some in the executive to shift the responsibility to ordinary people. Yet here we are looking back at regulations from the Christmas period, um, at a time when the virus was allowed to spread once again. Where is the acceptance of culpability on behalf of the executive? Where is the individual responsibility for the strategy advocated by this executive? Mr Speaker, there is a momentum growing 
for an entirely different uh, approach to regulations, and that amounts to a zero COVID strategy, something that has been raised already today and something I have raised uh, many times uh, uh, in this House, uh, but have been met with derision on many occasions. And last week, I wrote to the five party leaders on the executive uh, about this uh, issue. And I think, frankly, the excuses from the executive and the government for not implementing the zero COVID policy are pathetic um, and dangerous in the Irish government is pointing the finger at the North. They say they can't implement an elimination strategy because regulations here uh, are different and looser. Our airports could undermine their strategy and provide a backdoor travel to the South. Meanwhile, the Northern Executive muddies the waters by fixating on the differences <coughs> excuse me, between us and New Zealand. They have referenced the cost of an elimination strategy, while the cost of their own living with COVID strategy uh, surges, both in terms of money, uh, impact on the health service and lives. It has even been suggested by some that an all-Ireland strategy uh, could be the first step towards a united Ireland. The border, Mr Speaker, is being cynically uh, utilised by parties north and south as an excuse not to implement the necessary strategies and regulations to suppress this virus uh, and to save lives. There has been no attempt to come together, to work together, to hash out a costed uh, zero COVID strategy which could be implemented across this island. The absurdity of allowing, allowing a Miami border to stand in the way of getting us through this pandemic is striking. It has been said over and over again if this was foot and mouth or some other animal borne virus, there would have been an All Ireland strategy on day one. Excuse obstinance and posturing around the border are pathetically transparent and patently dangerous. This is just one reason why the campaign for a zero COVID strategy is gaining momentum. A zero COVID strategy, Mr Speaker, is not about uh, lifting the New Zealand uh, model and dropping it over into Ireland. It is about working to achieve the same levels of elimination, suppressing the virus through uh, reduced economic capacity and travel bans, rigorous testing and tracing, and the necess and necessary uh, uh, financial and mental health impacts uh, being put uh, uh, in place. It means listening to the growing calls from experts and working out how this can be done in Ireland. And I do not uh, hold out much hope uh, this executive on its own initiative will implement such a strategy, Mr Speaker, but uh, our party and others across the island are doing all they can uh, to continue to put pressure on both governments uh, to ensure that this is the, the way we force them to adopt such a strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Igor Maggot. And, uh I now call on Junior Minister Gordon Lyons to conclude and wind up the debate on all of the motions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I believe that standing orders mean that we have to um, be out of here this evening uh, by 8 o'clock, um, so I will do everything that I uh, can to make sure that I am finished up uh, before then. Um, I want to uh, uh, thank all of the, the members for their contributions. Uh, this evening, I think, as normal, we have often, within this debate, gone beyond um, the regulations that are in front of us, and perhaps we've got into a more general uh, COVID debate. But that's the way it has always been, and perhaps it will be the way uh, that it will always be uh, in the future as well. But maybe I could um, address some of the comments uh, that members have uh, have made. And I begin with the chair of the executive uh, office uh, committee, and I, I thank him for. Um, the comments that he has made and, and the fact that the committee has recognised um, the united approach that we need um, if we are to, to tackle uh, this pandemic. But I also note the concern that the member raised in regards to the complexity of getting the um, regulations to the floor of the Assembly. This is something that we have uh, talked about in this chamber time and time uh, again. Um, though I hope that all members would recognise um, the efforts that we have uh, made to, to make sure um, that we can get information to MLAs as quickly as possible. For, for example, um, the ad hoc committee, and as uh, Junior Minister Kearney had referenced in his uh, remarks, after the latest um, decisions were made by the executive, uh, a number of ministers made themselves available to that committee so that they could address the issues and the concerns that members have. Obviously, today we are operating under the structures that were uh, agreed within the coronavirus legislation, and that the executive um, bring um, these decisions, make the decisions in the executive, uh, and then bring them in this way uh, to the floor uh, of the House. I know that that is not ideal. That's why we have tried uh, to ensure, through the ad hoc committee, that there are opportunities for, for members um, to question ministers 
in relation to some of the changes uh, that, has, that, that have uh, been made. Um, Paula uh, Bradshaw um, spoke on behalf of the uh, committee and I thank her for the comments that she has made and, and I understand uh, the concerns uh, that she has expressed and that the committee clerk uh, has written to the department about the uh, concerns that she had raised uh, and I hope that she will get a reply uh, uh, to that. In terms of consultations uh, itself, obviously it's um, difficult. We don't have the time to go through the uh, uh, formal consultation procedure. Um, but we are doing everything that we can to have that close dialogue with key sectors, and um, we, we have done that in, in a number of ways, and we'll continue uh, to do that uh, as well. Uh, speaking um, as, as an individual uh, MLA, she also uh, raised the learning from reopening of sectors, and that is an important lesson for us um, that we will take into our planning for uh, recovery. And um, she obviously rightly stated that the case numbers are horrendous, which is why we're under the, the, the restrictions um, that we find ourselves in. And in relation to the new variant and the impact that it has and the use of a, of a travel ban, it's absolutely right um, in what she says, that it's transmitting uh, too rapidly and we're, we're suffering the consequences of that. Um, but we will consistently monitor that to see what further action uh, needs to be, to be taken. Uh, Mr Buckley uh, spoke next, and uh, can I thank him uh, for his contribution? Um, and it was uh, very, his, his passion for this is very, very clear. And I think that it's really, really important that we don't just nod these regulations through or in, in some way get used to them, um, because they are extreme. Um, we can see that in a number of ways and the impacts that it has. And it is absolutely right um, that as MLAs, um, we, we don't shirk our responsibilities in asking those questions uh, and making sure that we're trying to find out exactly why it is that we are bringing these in and to make sure that they are proportionate uh, at this time. Uh, he raised a, a number of impacts uh, that they are having on people, and he's absolutely right uh, to do so. Uh, let me mention in particular um, the concerns that he has in relation to, to cancer treatments. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we have these restrictions in place, is because of the um, wider health impact uh, on cases uh, and issues such as cancer. Because um, it's not restrictions that are preventing cancer operations from taking place. Uh, it's not the fact that restrictions are in place and so doctors are, are staying at home. It's because resources are being diverted to COVID um, cases. And that's why it's so important that we drive down the rate of infection um, so that we do not have patients uh, in ICU units and those ICU units can be, can be used um, and be ready so that we can have operations on cancer and all the other really important things uh, that he has raised. But he is absolutely right to make it clear uh, the impact that this is having on our health service. And we need to make sure that we are not only running a COVID service in Northern Ireland, but a health service, and that all of those issues uh, are being uh, addressed. And uh, members will be aware that the health minister has approved the establishment of a new regional uh, approach to ensure that available theatre capacity across Northern Ireland is allocated for those patients most in need of surgery, both during the surge and as we come out uh, of the surge. And this will include seeking to fully maximise all uh, available in-house health and social care and independent sector uh, capacity. Um, that in, in terms of, of, of cancer and non-COVID health, it's very, very important that we recognise the impacts uh, of that. Um, but we also do need to recognise the impacts that this is having on other parts of our daily lives as well. And we have said time and time again that we will um, make our decisions based not only on the R number, um, but also on the uh, capacity of our health service and also um, on the wider uh, societal and economic uh, impacts. And that is a, the, the case um, that is frequently pressed with the health minister when he is bringing these restrictions to the assembly. Um, it is constantly raised with him about the impact uh, on mental health. Uh, we frequently talk uh, about the impact of, of poverty as well, and, and I've lost count of the number of times, for example, and, and I'm sure the CMO won't, won't mind me saying this, but he, he always points to the fact 
um, that uh, poverty is poor for health, that unemployment is poor uh, for health. And we need to take into consideration all of these aspects. And I can assure the member uh, and others um, that that is what's, what's taking place within executive meetings and that all of these issues are being considered and it's not just COVID uh, alone. And I'm sure that everyone in this House is aware of those impacts and the devastating impact um, of all of, of these restrictions um, that, that they are having on people here right across Northern Ireland uh, and beyond. I am thinking about, about mental health and the impact that that's having uh, on people here. And that is devastating, and I'm sure we've all heard stories uh, about how that mental health crisis has gotten even worse over the last number uh, of months. We can see a huge impact in terms of education as well. And as useful as remote learning can be, it is no substitute whatsoever for that face-to-face -face, uh, teaching. Mm -hmm. And I am concerned uh, about the impact that that uh, is having. Uh, we also um, see it in, in a number of other ways. And, and I think of, of special, special needs children in particular. And the stories that I have heard of special needs children not getting um, the speech and language therapy, the music therapy, the physiotherapy um, that they had been, been used to uh, before. So lots of impacts um, that these regulations are having on our lives. And so it's absolutely right that we take all of these uh, into consideration and don't just look at, at COVID uh, alone. In fact, there is that responsibility uh, on us to, to do that. And so uh, I thank the member. Uh, he had also re uh, recognised the problems around, uh, around click and collect, and I hope that I have, I have answered that, that Mr Middleton also, as well with others, uh, had raised. Uh, Ms Anderson is not in her place, uh, but I will, of course, raise the issue uh, of photographers. Uh, it does seem a bit odd that if you're going to a photographer, you don't want to uh, have a mask on when you're getting your family photograph done. Uh, I see uh, what Mr McGrath is going to say. He's probably going to um, say that for some people that might well be uh, an improvement, um, but it is, a, it is an important issue, and if it's something that we can get flexibilities around, I think uh, it is important that we do that. Uh, in relation to taxis and financial support, um, uh, members will be aware that grants are being paid out and support has been put uh, in place, and uh, the members' concerns relating to taxi drivers uh, will be raised with the Minister for uh, Infrastructure. Uh, Alan Chambers um, had raised the issue of, of an exit strategy, and whilst I understand his point about it being difficult um, to uh, get into current circumstances, we, we must start looking at our recovery now so that we are prepared, uh, and that includes both how we come out of the current restrictions in the short term and also the wider economic and societal recovery processes uh, after that. And members will be aware of the original pathway to recovery document that the executive had worked on in, in late spring and early summer, and it was agreed at the last executive meeting that that work will be taken forward for, for a new and updated uh, document in relation um, to recovery uh, to make sure that we do have that plan and how we uh, not only move from restrictions but into a, into a better place uh, of recovery as well. And I know that that issue was raised uh, a number of times. Um, Mr Middleton had uh, raised the issue of, of churches and um, Minister Kearney and I have had a number of engagements with, with many groups over the, the time that we have been uh, in office. And I do want to thank the representatives of local churches here for the way in which they have approached uh, our, our discussions. Uh, I think that they have always been uh, sensible and measured and thoughtful discussions, and it's good that we're able to have that working relationship with them, as we do with uh, many other leaders in other sectors uh, as well. And uh, I want to thank them for, for their input uh, and for the discussions that we uh, have had as well. He also raises the issue uh, of funerals, um, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, again, um, I absolutely agree with everything uh, that he has said. I understand how difficult it is uh, when you lose a, a loved one. Um, we all do. And we want to make sure, um, don't we, that we uh, are able to, to grieve in the way in which we're all accustomed to. We want to be able to have people with us sharing uh, in our time uh, of, of sadness uh, and of grief. But I have to say uh, to those, um, uh, and this goes beyond funerals, but, but to any event or to anything that breaches the regulations, I would say to them, what makes you so special? 
Why do you think that the rules do not apply to you? Because so many other people in our society are adhering to the rules uh, and to these restrictions, difficult as it may be, but they are adhering to them. So I think it's really important that we all send that message, um, that we need to show um, that that leadership um, and that um, working together with, with, with other people uh, as well. Um, I note the, the concerns that he has made, uh, he has, uh, made as well in relation to um, uh, click and collect. And um, I get the sense from, from Mr. Middleton that he's very concerned about being able to get flowers for, for Valentine's Day in particular, uh, it seems. And I think that if we can make common sense uh, adjustments to the regulations, that, that we should be willing uh, to do so. Uh, Pat Sheehan um, made a, a, a number of comments, and I agree the, the, the pressure on our frontline staff has been immense uh, over the last number uh, of months. That's why we all need to make sure that we do work together, uh, adhere to the rules as best uh, as we can, uh, and to the guidance so that we can relieve the pressure uh, on them. And the issue of travel is continually uh, under review, both east-west and, and north-south. Uh, and the issue of people bringing the virus uh, into Northern Ireland is, of course, a concern. Uh, and that is an, an issue that we talk about um, frequently with other, um, with other governments across the UK and, of course, uh, with our counterparts in the Republic uh, of Ireland. I, I think I picked up on him uh, whenever he was referring to the um, proposed uh, travel ban with the rest of, uh, of GB. Um, he said, I, I don't care who the scientist is uh, that says that. Um, but that was the, the advice, the evidence that we had gotten at, at that time within the executive, um, that the risk uh, uh, was small, and um, that's why we took um, the, steps that we, the steps that we did uh, in relation uh, to that. I'm not going to give away at this, uh, at, at this time. Uh, just m moving on then to uh, Kelly Armstrong. Uh, Kelly Armstrong began uh, her speech bemoaning the negativity of the debate and then proceeded to highlight her grievances with um, everything that was in the regulations that she didn't uh, like. Um, she also said that this was a, an orange and green uh, debate. And uh, I have to say, and I, I wish the member were, were still here so I could raise this with her, because I don't think that this has been particularly uh, an orange and uh, green debate. In fact, what I have witnessed over uh, the last three hours um, has been people bringing legitimate concerns and I think there's been a sincerity to these debates, which is always here, actually, and always evident. And um, I don't think there has been a lot of orange-green uh, point scoring uh, at all. I think that was evidenced by, by Mr. Sheehan, actually, when he showed that he actually welcomed uh, the fact um, that the army was, was coming in here uh, to help. So uh, I, I do disagree with her uh, in relation to that. In regards to the main point of contact for MLAs, the main point of information is, of course, Northern Ireland Direct, which is updated regularly with the latest information relating to the regulations and restrictions. But we also have a team who deal with queries. And if the member is content, uh, I will pass her contact details uh, on to them. Um, uh, uh, very briefly. Thank you, Minister, for giving way. I would just like to ask if my contact details could also be forwarded on to that team. Yes, I'm sure that that can, be, um, that can be sorted out. We'll try and make sure that there is information there, a point of contact uh, for members. And can I just say I do recognise, because as, as a constituency MLA myself, I understand what happens uh, to your mailbox, your WhatsApp groups, your um, Facebook pages and all the rest of it. You get inundated with questions and uh, we want to help uh, as much as possible uh, with that. Um, can I also just speak briefly to um, Ms Hunter's uh, comments? I share uh, the members' concerns uh, for the most vulnerable during this time, and we are committed to doing everything that we can to help, and I, I welcome her recognition of the impacts that um, uh, the current restrictions are having uh, on mental health uh, as well. Um, Mr McNulty had um, raised the issue of, of death um, and that we will all likely know someone who has died, um, a sad but realistic perspective on what it is that we are uh, uh, facing. And um, he went on to talk about life returning to normal and um, we obviously want to be in that position as, as soon uh, as possible. And key to that, obviously, we've talked about exit strategy time and time again. Vaccines are, are key uh, to that. 
and we'll bring forward um, our recovery plan and uh, we trust that in, in conjunction with um, the vaccines and the recovery plan that we really see um, how we get back uh, to normality. Um, Ms Woods um, had a, a number of issues that was uh, raised uh, uh, in relation to the pre-Christmas uh, restrictions um, and, and relaxations that were um, put in place at that time. And, and I hope that the member would recognise that we're dealing with a rapidly changing uh, situation. It doesn't always run smoothly. It isn't a straight line on a, on a graph. And we've been reacting as best as we can. As I previously, previously have said, nobody has ever gotten this uh, right. And I think that if we had said to um, members of this House, five days, that's what you can all have for Christmas. And then the, if we did not change that um, piece of advice based on the evidence that was presented to us, we would rightly be accused then of, of not listening to the advice that was, was in front of us. So sometimes we have to make decisions, sometimes um, things have to be changed about quickly, and we thank the public for um, their patience as we do that. And so we're very much, um, uh, to, to refer to her point uh, about young people, we're committed to engaging with our young people. Um, the First and Deputy First Minister did um, both engage in a junior press briefing in December. Uh, with Cool FM, and we're actively looking at other opportunities to engage with young people uh, in the coming weeks. I, I agree with what the member has said, uh, insofar as we um, shouldn't just be paying lip service to, to our young people, but giving them real opportunities to, to engage. And I'm happy to look at any other uh, recommendations that come forward. Very, very, very briefly. Thank the junior minister for giving way. I would make one suggestion. There had been a Northern Ireland Youth Forum political panel and press conference arranged by the executive office uh, last year, and unfortunately that was cancelled because of political fallout. May I suggest to the executive office that they rearrange that as soon as possible with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum? More than happy to take that back to the first and deputy first minister, uh, Mr. Speaker. Just then to come on. To the, the, the comments made by uh, Mr Alistair, the, the member asked why we can't start uh, to relax restrictions now, because the R value is now below 1, and the rate of new infections uh, is declining. The difficulty that we have is that we're a very high level of hospital occupancy, and we know uh, that this caseload will take a considerable time to ease and reduce. Of course, it's not the policy of the executive to get the R number below 1, it's the policy of the executive to keep the R number uh, below 1, and that's why we can't let up as soon as the number uh, drops uh, below uh, 1. And uh, I think I've covered um, most of the comments that have been uh, made um, uh, and raised by Mr. Mr. Carl in previous uh, comments. And uh, so, Mr. Speaker, can I, can I just again say that we do recognise the impact that these restrictions are having on people. This is not something that we take uh, lightly. And I had hoped uh, many months ago um, that we wouldn't have to be back in this chamber again, doing what we are doing now and uh, bringing all of the negative consequences uh, that come uh, with these uh, restrictions. Uh, however, uh, I think something has changed now compared to uh, what has happened. Uh, in the past when we have been in front of this House, and that is that we have had this uh, rapid rollout uh, of the vaccine. And there has been tremendous um, progress. Uh, great to see so many of our older people, uh, so many of our care home residents that have been vaccinated, and I think we need to, to give credit um, to our health and social care uh, services who have done so much to ensure uh, that that has happened. And I hope that with the continued rollout uh, of that vaccine, it means that we will not need to bring restrictions like this uh, constantly back uh, to the House time and time again. That's what we all uh, want uh, to see. Um, so let me again thank all of those within our health service that have worked uh, so hard to get us to this point. And my plea to the public would be, uh, please stick with us. I know this has been difficult. I know people are fed up. I know, I know that I'm fed up uh, and want this to be over. Uh, but let us just keep going. Um, through these next uh, number of weeks uh, and months. And I've no doubt that if we do and if we work together, the normality um, that we all seek um, will, will be with us again uh, shortly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Thank you. And the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Number Two Amendment Number Nineteen, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the second motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the clerk to read the motion. But the Health Protection Coronavirus <coughs> Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 20, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. Moved. Thank you, Jan. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 20, the NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the third motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. And I call the Junior Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. And the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 21, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We will now move on to the fourth motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 22, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. And I call the Junior Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. And the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 22, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the fifth motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 23, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. And I call the Junior Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 23, Regulations NI 2020, be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the sixth motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. And I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. But the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 24, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 be approved. Thank you. And I call the Junior Minister to move the motion. Moved. Thank you. And the question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 24, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We will now move on to the final motion on the Health Protection Regulations, which has already been debated. And I will ask the Clerk to read the motion. That the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 25, Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, be approved. Thank you. And I call the Junior Minister to move the motion. Moved. The question is that the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions No. 2, Amendment No. 25, Regulations NI 2020 be approved. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next item on the order paper is the adjournment, and the question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. Thank you. Assembly is adjourned. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Plenary. Programme signed.